Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. We are so excited to be continuing our series with Mike from the amazing LDS Discussions website. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about Book of Mormon and DNA, again, with Mike from LDS Discussions. And, uh, you know, we've already done, I think, four episodes so far. We've done Treasure Digging. We've done the gold plates. We've done Book of Mormon translation, and we have done. Um, uh, what was it, Mike? 100, 116, <laughs> 116 pages. pages. <laughs> yeah, and now we're doing. Uh, we're jumping to DNA, and we're super excited to have with us for this episode, Gerardo. Hey, Gerardo. Hey, John. So glad to have you. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Thanks for taking time off your busy work schedule to join us. <laughs> yeah. Super excited about this one. Yeah. And and then of course uh, we have we have with us um, Mike. Hey Mike, what's up everybody? Yeah, how are you enjoying these episodes so far? They're fun. It's you know it's funny to go over them again later on. You, I've forgotten a lot. I did most of these like a year ago, so it's it's kind of been interesting to read them again and, and then to go through them and, and hopefully, like I said, we're just hoping people are finding finding some use out of them. I'm sure my our listeners and viewers join us in being amazed at the command of detail and the conceptual command you have of all these topics, uh, because it's a lot to keep in one brain and you, you do an amazing job. I don't know about that, but you know, it, like I said, and one of the things I mentioned in one of our previous episodes, it's just, you know, anyone can do it. You know, I'm, I'm not like, uh, some, you know, scholar that has a uh, three degrees in history. And, and so there are people that can run circles around me all day long. And, and I think the fact that I can at least get to this point, just shows that when you really do dig into this stuff, you can really draw some conclusions that are evidence-based. And, you know, like I've mentioned many times, you put the piece, the pieces of the puzzle back together and you can do it in a way where you don't have to stretch. You you can have command of the issues because as long as you take the evidence at face value, um, you can make it work together in a seamless way without having to, to jam it together. Yeah. Well, again, LDSdiscussions.com is the website. There's amazing detail there, but our job here is to try and synthesize each of these essays. So there's an essay on um, Book of Mormon and DNA, which is one of like 50 or 60 essays that you have on your website. So we're going to be covering that essay. We'll include a link to it in the show notes. Um, but let's go ahead and, and dive in. Yeah, let's do it. All right. So uh, we begin. What? How do you want to kind of set up the situation? Well with, with DNA, it's a little trickier because we don't have as much to talk about before. Most of this is going to be about apologetics, but just for me personally, when I was a convert, um, I was told that the Book of Mormon was basically the origin story of the Native Americans. And it gave the story and the history of the Native Americans before the European settlers arrived. And we finally knew um, that Jesus had visited this continent just as, you know, just as it did leave it by itself. And, and so basically, what was crazy for me was when I started to finally do the deep dive into this was to learn that the DNA testing that came out uh, really without any question tells us that the narrative from the Book of Mormon, that these are the Native Americans came from Jerusalem is simply not the case. And this is exemplified in no better way than to say that the introduction to the Book of Mormon was changed from saying that the Native Americans were the principal ancestors of the American Indians, as I was taught to saying they are among the ancestors of the, of the American Indians. Yeah, and this is um, this is a really important thing to summarize, that for almost 200 years, everyone knew, Joseph yeah. Smith knew, Brigham Young knew, all the missionaries to, the, to Ohio and, and to the frontiers knew, all prophets, seers, and revelators between Joseph Smith and let's just say, I don't know, uh, Spence W. Kimball. Yep. Everyone knew who the Lamanites were. The Lamanites were Native Americans, North, Central, and South America, along with Pacific Islanders, yep. Alaskans. Gerardo, anything else you want to add to that? No, that's what I was taught. That is why I taught on my mission. Yeah. Growing up in Mexico, <laughs> did you have any doubts about who the Lamanites were? No doubt that I was a Lamanite. You were yeah. a Lamanite. Yeah. That yeah. makes it very personal. Yeah. 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 For sure. Yeah, and then for for like Gen Zers or even millennials or Mormons who are unaware, this is just a it was a groundbreaking thing. Do you remember the year 
around the year that they changed the Book of Mormon title page, Gerardo or or Mike? Do you guys remember? Around it's, 2010, I think. Uh, 2006. Oh, wow. 2006. So yeah. my my memory is this is just my memory, and I'll just give a little bit of background. I'm working at Microsoft. It's it's you know 1999, 2000, 2001. I don't remember the exact date. May have been a, a couple of years later, but before 2004, I remember reading an article that there was this um, this professor named Thomas Murphy mm. that had that had studied that 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 you know DNA genetics had come out. They'd started studying you know DNA. They they um, sequenced the genome or whatever. They were able to look at DNA with a new level of scrutiny that they had never done before, and then you know uh, immediately. You know, um, Thomas Murphy, a scholar, starts looking into and applying DNA science to Native Americans because wouldn't it be amazing to be able to show that yep. that all the Native Americans tie directly back to Israelites somehow, some way? And immediately, Thomas Murphy was called into a disciplinary council and threatened with excommunication. And it was only because um, he threatened... Uh, you know, he kind of threatened. He he threatened to call the newspapers and have the media show up at his disciplinary council. That the church called off his disciplinary council. But this is all happening before uh, the church changes its title page. Yep. And then Simon Southerton comes out with his book, "Losing a Lost Tribe," and all of a sudden it becomes sort of irrefutable that Native Americans their DNA doesn't tie to um, you know Israel or the Middle East, but instead it ties to Asia. And all of a sudden, mid-2000s, early 2000s, the church has a huge problem. Yeah. Gerardo, did you yeah. want to add something well, to that? I was just gonna, I, I didn't remember, like, it's just crazy because I went on my mission in 2013 and we were still teaching and learning by memory uh, this the introduction of the Book of Mormon that said that it was the principal ancestors of the American Indians the Lamanites were. So even though it changed to 2006, like, I don't know if the prints, I like hadn't, you know, like there were still so many old ones that have been printed. And so I didn't know I, up until 2013, my whole mission was teaching, we're teaching in Mexico city that, that all Mexicans were part of the Lamanites. Yeah. And again, the, it's, it's, it's a technique the church uses when they have a big change that kind of overwrites something really big about the past. Like, let's say they want to sh get rid of uh, Mormon doctrine, or, you know, and stop publishing it and selling it, mm. or they want to get rid of miracle of forgiveness, or they want to change something about the narrative. They never just come out and tell everybody, look, we just found out all this DNA evidence. The Book of Mormon title page says this. Now we're going to change. Now we're going to change it because yeah. of that. They don't do that. They just quietly make the change. Most people don't even know for decades, most members will still believe the old way, yeah. but then over time, um, the narrative switches and nobody is the wiser. Right. And that's what they did in this case. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I hope, Mike, I hope you don't mind that history, but the truth is we all understand that history because we lived it, but non-Mormons and then a bunch of uh, newer people, newer to the faith crisis stuff will, will have unbelievably inexplicably never heard any of this right yeah and like i said when i i, I, con I converted um i took the discussions in the mid 90s i converted the late 90s and this was just it wasn't even a point of any ambiguity it was this is the history of the native americans and these are every native american comes from this because there was no one here before it so i mean it was not yeah. there was no we'll get to the apologetics but none of that really existed when i took the discussions and so so when this should have been this. a major explosion, this change, because yeah. the Book of Mormon title page, I'm sure you're going to talk about this. It's what is it wasn't didn't Joseph Smith write it? No, who wrote? No. So this Michael. introduction was added, I believe, okay, in okay. 1981. OK. And so this is not considered to be off the plates. OK, but it is a big deal, right? It's a big and deal a, just because it really highlights what the, where they where the church was as far as the beliefs and the truth claims. Yeah, because, yeah, that's what all prophecies and revelators from Joseph to basically. Yes. But yeah, spend something kibble. So, the, so, OK, so back to your story. So this uh, the, the church quietly changes. Um, yes. W around something what year? Uh, 2006. If we go to the next slide, it just kind of goes over this with okay. more text. So basically, okay. it just shows the DNA studies were so conclusive that it forced the church to make this this one word change. And so, 
Uh, they created the introduction in 1981. I believe it was Bruce R. McConkie who did it, but I'm not positive. And it just says they're the principal ancestors of the American Indians. And then after 2006, they had to change it to our among. And the thing is, you think, well, it's just changing one word. But that one word change changes the entire historicity, the entire narrative of the Book of Mormon with just a single word in the introduction. Yeah, it's a big deal. Yeah. And um, so when we go to the next slide... We're basically setting up just the problem that the DNA poses for the Book of Mormon. That most of this episode is going to be in the apologetics itself. And so we're going to work off the gospel topics essay for a lot of it, just because that is what we would consider to be the church's best response to it. And in the essay, they say some have contended that the migrations mentioned in the Book of Mormon did not occur because the majority of DNA identified to date in modern native peoples most closely resembles that of Eastern Asian populations. And what I want to say is when the church says some, they mean everybody outside of the church, because uh, this directly contradicts what Spencer W. Kimball said, who you just mentioned. He said, they are not Orientals. They are from the Near East. I think they meant they are not from the Near East, I think. It is not impossible that there could have seeped across the Bering Strait a little Oriental blood is claimed by some people, but basically... These Lamanites, including the Indian, are the descendants of Lehi who left Jerusalem 600 years BC. So Spencer W. Kimball is saying, without any question, that the Book of Mormon, the Native Americans, are not Orientals. They are not from you know the, the East Asia. And so, when the essay makes it sound like, well, you know, some people uh, have said that. No, I mean everyone in the church said that they were from Jerusalem, and everyone outside the church post DNA is saying the opposite. So that is a clash. Again, where the church backed down, at least within the introduction page, and it's not something that you can just brush away now because now you have, what, 180 years at that point of quotes to work from, from church leaders and prophets and seers and revelators. You can't just throw them off as, you know, the opinions of men. It's too seeped into the revelations as well. It's like This is a problem that is going to, we're going to see as we go through this presentation, you cannot, you just can't shake off. Yeah, I think it's interesting that they're saying because the majority of DNA identified to date is modern native people uh, closely resembles the Asians. It's not the majority; it's literally all right. Like yeah. there, it's like ninety nine point six percent or something like that. It's it's pretty much all of it. And then um, Simon Southerton was on, and I, I, he gave up what the rest of it was. He, he kind of went through what the remaining percentage was, and. The, the point is everyone in the world has some similar DNA. And so what he's yeah. saying is you could still see where they're coming. Like you could see the, the, the direction of, of the, the population genetics, but yeah, what's not there is not proving the book of Mormon. It's just stuff right. that's similar between people. Yeah. Yeah. And so like, if we're just going very simple, simple analysis, it should be a major smoking gun. Number one, that the DNA tells us the native Americans are from Asia and that this contradicts almost 200 years of prophets, seers, and revelators. Just without having any more on the podcast, yeah. we could end the podcast now with them changing the title page of the Book of Mormon and say, wow, game over, Book of Mormon is dead, right? Well, <laughs> I mean, I mean you, yeah, could well, we, you could do that. You could do that. We talk all the we talk all the time about like smoking. Like I always think of it like I read a lot in the overview. It's like, do you look for smoking guns or do you look for death by a thousand cuts? Because you could go either way. And this one, I would actually, I mean, I fully agree it's a smoking gun. And that's why we're like on slide three or four. The rest of the presentation is pretty much all apologetics because this is something that is yeah. is settled when you talk to geneticists and when you and, and it's not just DNA. It's the fact that they knew before DNA studies confirmed it because they knew from migration patterns, mm. they knew from archaeology. This is not something that was a surprise. It was only a surprise in the sense that now it puts the Book of Mormon in a corner because the Book of Mormon has been saying something that is now confirmed by a very testable method that we use for so many other aspects of our life, whether it's medical, whether it's you know crime, whether it's you know sending in our DNA or saliva to D uh, 23 and me. Now the Book of Mormon has to then go what do I, you know, how do we then make sense of the fact that the claims we're making is now refuted by pretty much every field of study? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's huge. And of course we've already talked about the problems with the golden plates, the problem with the right. folk magic, the problem, you know, with the last 116 pages, we haven't, we're, we haven't even yet gotten into the anachronisms yes. and all the problems with the content, you know, yeah. but, but this is just a, a major, major deal. And today we're going to understand all the reasons why. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we'll continue with the slides. And um, so basically what we're saying is all the leaders have been saying this. And so 
Um, if you go to the next slide, what the essay is going to do, and, and we notice this, and, and you have, for those of you listening, if you have not listened, it's you did it a, a year, long time ago, and it's not on video, but I would highly recommend, and we should put in the show notes, the um, link to your podcast called Three Geneticists, um, talk about the Book of Mormon DNA essay. Yeah, it's a good one. Um, because they do a really good job. Uh, I think it's only about an hour and a half, too. So, I mean, I, I w- that essay I, I listened to when I was first going through it a few times because it is a lot of, of, of in the weeds type stuff, but they make it very understandable. And so one of the things that this essay is going to do, and we'll point it out as we go, is they try to make it sound like this is not easy for us to understand. It's not conclusive. It's very, you know, tentative. And what they do in, in that podcast is they do a really good job of showing why it's not tentative and why it's not that hard to understand. And so I just wanted to point that out before we go into this, because the essay is going to say, The evidence assembled to date suggests that the majority of Native Americans carry largely Asian DNA. Scientists theorize that in an era that predated Book of Mormon accounts, a relatively small group of people migrated from Northeast Asia to the Americas by way of a land bridge that connected Siberia to Alaska. And again, I'm just pointing out that they're using the word suggest and theorize to kind of, I'm not saying they're poisoning the well, but they're trying to make the science seem like it's just not that conclusive. conclusive. It's not that solid. And as a way to if you're the reader of this essay to make you think right off the bat, well, this is just one idea. It's not necessarily the predominant one. And the problem is even since this essay, the technology gets better and better and better. And it's telling us the exact same thing. And and just the last note, and and I put this on the end of the slide because it's important. Imagine you got up on Sunday and you said that the book of Mormon suggests, um, you know, something about the Mormon church or Joseph Smith's, first vision suggests that God and Jesus are different people and that the Mormon church theorizes that <laughs> they're separate. I mean, the problem is those are, those are words that are used to diminish the other person's claim. And I just want to point that out because if you flip that, you would not accept it on the other side. And so I really don't like, I realize from a technical term, they are, it is a theory, like the law of gravity is a theory, but I'm just saying this is a far and away conclusive and it keeps getting tested and tested over and over and over again. And it's telling us the same thing. We're not getting a different picture and so right off the bat, this the apologetics are trying to tell you, guys, this is not that big a deal because we don't really know. We, d- we do know. Yeah, like one of the most condemning things about this Gospel Topics essay is that it didn't come out, what, 10 or 20 years prior. Right. Like the church knew this stuff at least a full 10 years prior, and they didn't talk about it. Why did they start talking? Why did this says, I'm assuming this says it came out around 2014. Yeah, I think it was 14 or 15. Why, why did it come out in 2014? Because the internet came out in 2000 and well, I mean, it, the Mormon internet started really getting in, going yeah. in 2004. By 2005, I'm interviewing people. I'm interviewing Simon Southerton or Richard Bushman and others. And members start becoming aware of this DNA problem. And then all of a sudden people start losing their faith over it. And so the church is forced to create apologetics. Um, whereas before they just preferred to kind of keep, keep it away from its members. So no one would even know about the problem and have no need to understand an apologetic about it. Yeah. And yeah. it's just, like I said, when we, as we go through it, yeah. and it's just, you know, yep. we'll, we'll, we're going to try to keep it at a high level just because you're of the right, fact you're that right. You, you've had a, a episodes with Simon Southerton who can do this. And you know, can, obviously I can't even can be in the same room with him on this stuff. But the, the point is because of people like Simon, because of people that you've had on your podcast and other people have had, I can understand what the studies are saying, even if I couldn't tell you the specifics. And that's, that's what the church is trying to tell you. You can't do it, except you can. And the only reason they're telling you not to kind of, to take this at face value is because it hurts their claim. If DNA had come out, and said, the Native Americans have large strains of DNA from Jerusalem. Do you think they'd be saying that the studies suggest and theorize it? No, they'd be saying the Book of Mormon is true. And, and that's what I'm saying. And, and again, this works both ways. It's critic and apologist. I'm just saying they're setting up this essay to, say, to tell us there's other ways. And as we go through it, I'm, we're going to show a lot of examples to show, no, that there's just, there's just not. And as uncomfortable as that's going to make us, it is what it is. Yeah. And just one more piece of the historical puzzle what you all need to know is is that after Thomas Murphy was threatened with the disciplinary council for um, publishing some essays around DNA in the Book of Mormon, Simon Southerton, who we now have a series on Mormon stories with, he came out with the book called Losing a Lost Tribe. Um, he's come up with the follow-up book, which we're offering for free for anyone who donates 
um, to the Simon Southerton series. But the point is he comes out with losing a lost tribe. And what do they do? They excommunicate him. And if you're excommunicated sort of for apostasy past 1992, what that basically means by 2022 is you said something true that was embarrassing and damaging to the church. The church didn't really bother excommunicating people that gave harebrained theories that that really didn't show the church wasn't true. They only bothered excommunicating people who demonstrated facts about science or history that showed the church wasn't true. And the evidence for the fact that that's what Simon Southerton uh, was doing was that he got excommunicated yep. for his book. So we'll include a link both to his original book. And Gerardo, do you remember the update of the new book that Simon is offering? I can't remember. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll make sure and include a link to Simon's update because it's, it's, it's basically all the DNA evidence updated in 2020 or 2021, and it's, it's a really important piece. So yeah. I'll make sure Jen includes that in the show notes. Okay. Is it, is it the sacred curse? Yes, sacred okay. curse. Okay. Thank, curse. Thank, thank you. We will include a link to that as well. Okay. So, yeah. So, um, what we want to do is continue on. And so what we're saying here is just the fact that they're right off the bat, they're trying to make this seem like it's not a solid amount of science that's giving us, even though they changed the introduction. So if we go to the next slide, um, I think this is where we start to show, um, some areas of DNA in America before the book of Mormon. And so this is from our, um, overview online. And it just shows, so the DNA of an ancient Alaskan infant ch called, and I can't pronounce that, but Sunrise Child Girl tells us that the first Americans arrived at least 20,000 years ago, which is 14,000 years before the biblical fall of Adam and Eve and 17,000 years before the Book of Mormon narrative. The next one is a teenage girl known as Naya, whose skeleton, along with eight others, was found preserved underwater in a cave on the Yucatan Peninsula. Collagen from her bones was securely dated to 13. 15,000 years ago. Her DNA has been sequenced. It is fully Native American, directly ancestral to modern Native Americans, and descended from Sunrise Child Girls people. Uh, Naya's dating and genetic makeup is also consistent with the recent discovery in Montana of remains of a 12,700-year-old boy um, known as the Anzic Child. And then one final one is to say, in May 2020, DNA from the remains of a Siberian man who died about 14,000 years ago, revealed him to be the earliest known person in the world to have the specific mix of genes seen in people with Native American ancestry. And the point just, just to say, not only does the DNA not show that they did not come from Jerusalem, but they're way before the Book of Mormon times. And so when we before get the, the point, Bible times, before the Bible times. And so that's why DNA is such a tricky thing, because on one hand, we wouldn't rely on it, right? So we all have family members who have done 23 me and they're so excited because you find out maybe you have some Native American ancestry. I mean, all these other things. I mean, I've heard, I've heard people that are in the church talk about how they have Lamanite ancestry because they, they have Native American. <laughs> wow. But the problem is we also have Neanderthal DNA and those tests yeah. and those go back, what, 40,000 years. So right. when you when you want to use DNA to show that you're related to or you, your family comes from certain places, you can't just stop there and be like, well, that's my story. And it's like, no, no, no. We go back further and further. And the problem is you know, in the 19th century, we had no knowledge of any of this. So Joseph Smith would have had no way of writing it in. And obviously in the Bible, the only thing that people in the bio biblical times knew was what was around them. And so the DNA is a problem because it just, it, it really dates these scriptures to when they were written because they didn't have the information we have today. If, if Joseph Smith writes the Book of Mormon today, you better believe it's going to be completely different because our worldview is different. And, and, and this just shows that even if you want to say, you know, the DNA might not match, but it doesn't mean, you know, the, just the, the, the location where you come from. It's like the, the dating is also a huge problem. Yeah. And I just like to summarize for people that get lost in the words and all the science. Well, these quotes that you just showed us say, uh, not only pose a problem for the book of Mormon, but they, they pose a problem to Mormonism and to the Bible, because if humans were in North America, 20,000 years ago, you know, the, the Mormon church teaches, even from the Doctrine and Covenants, let alone every prophet, seer, and revelator from Adam until today, yeah. Russell M. Nelson, we've all been taught that the earth is 7,000 years old, that Adam and Eve literally lived in the Garden of Eden six to 7,000 years ago, that there was a global flood. Um, and, and so this archaeological evidence, this DNA evidence showing humans in the Americas up to 20,000 years ago not just disproves the Book of Mormon, but also disproves an orthodox reading of Mormonism and the Bible, 
literal Adam and Eve, Noah's flood, all of that, which then leads to the Jaredites, the Tower of Babel, which then leads to the Jaredites. All that gets disproven by DNA evidence. Yeah. Am I wrong, Gerardo? Yeah. I think you're right. No. And um, uh, Mike mentioned something really important. He, he, and, and this is something Simon always brings up, the Neanderthal DNA. Like Neanderthal is a species that doesn't exist anymore, right? Like they were yeah. uh, pr before Homo sapiens. And the fact that we can trace Neanderthal DNA in humans today, you know, like yep. I think w when I did 20, I'm, I'm pulling up my 23 and me, and it says that I have more Neanderthal DNA uh, than 93% of uh, of the population. Um, the fact that they can they're able to trace that small part of like a, a species that doesn't even exist anymore, that's huge. Because like if you think about that, then why? How come we can't find even the smallest part of Lehi's DNA or Hebrew DNA in any of the Native Americans that have been tested so far? Yep. Yeah, and that's, that's basically the problem. It's just the fact that we, you know, the information that we can get from this DNA is getting better and better and better. And yet right. everything we're finding out about the world is getting more and more refined, except for the Book of Mormon, because the Book of Mormon just, it has no foothold. There's n there's no evidence of it. And in the DNA, the more we learn, the more we realize it, it, it's out of place. And, and it, again, it's going to make us uncomfortable if you're a believing member to hear this. But that's why we're doing these overviews to try to show you and lay out all of this stuff side by side, because... It, it it is what it is and it sucks and it's painful and i get how much it it i mean just from going through it and and i wasn't born into it so i wasn't quite as you know i, I know i wasn't as attached as someone who lived it from the moment they were born but we have to understand that this evidence is real and it doesn't go away just because we are uncomfortable or afraid of it or because we want to wish it away and and it sucks but yeah. It's there. And i just want to refer people we did recent episodes with Simon Southerton on a literal Adam and Eve Garden of Eden and on yeah. Noah's flood. Are there others that we've done? And evolution. We'll, evolution. We'll, we'll yeah. include links in the show notes because yeah. those go into depth on these issues. Okay. They do. And Let's they're really good. And so if we go to the next slide, um, we kind of talked about how there were people in America long before the Book of Mormon times. And so you read these parts of Second Nephi and it says um, there that there shall none come into this land, save they be brought by the hand of the Lord. And behold, it is wisdom that this land should be kept as yet from the knowledge of other nations, and they shall be kept from all other nations that they may possess this land unto themselves. So the Book of Mormon absolutely is saying without question that the Americas were completely empty until the arrival of the Jaredites. There's no ambiguity here. There's just there's just no ambiguity. And so none, when, none, none it, shall come into this land, save yeah, they're just, brought by the hand of the Lord. Yeah, there's just no way around this. And again, we're going to see this as we go through the apologetics. So I just want to get this out quick because when people tell you that the Book of Mormon was just part of a, of a larger population, it, there is no textual evidence for it and a lot of textual evidence against it. So it's not even like the Book of Mormon is kind of ambiguous and we can kind of draw that conclusion. It is saying the opposite. And so just keep these, these passages in mind as we go because they're so important to kind of understanding why these apologetics just cannot work with the evidence we have. Man, that is just, that is so important, that slide right there. Yeah, because it's giving the quote from the Gospel Topic essay yeah. from the church's website saying, oh no, um, we, like, no one's claiming the that... The Book of Mormon itself yeah. does not claim right. that the peoples it describes were either yeah. predominant or exclusive, Right, right. And then, and then you you juxtapose that with with the actual what yeah. the actual Book of Mormon says, and yeah. it's not only in Second Nephi. My understanding, it's in several other places, right? Yeah, I think it might be. We have uh, so on ldsdiscussions.com, we have the annotated essay who yeah. that was done by a guy I've mentioned before named Kellen, and I swear that essay is awesome, and it it um, goes into way more detail than we'll go into today. So that's another area if you want to read beyond the beyond the overview topic for DNA, the annotated essay, which is linked from there. He did such a good job of putting so much information together, and, and there's so many quotes from leaders and from the Book of Mormon that just show that there's there's no there's no confusion here until the DNA testing yeah. forces them to change course. And I mean, there's just I don't know what else to say because it, it, again, it speaks for itself. We don't have to keep telling you what it says because it's right there for us all to see. And yeah, we're this, gonna this is reminding me of the 116 pages. Like the story is. doesn't change until there's a problem. Yeah, that's and then all of a sudden is. the story changes. Yeah, I mean, you make a claim, it doesn't happen, and then when the claim doesn't happen, you you switch what you say the basically <laughs> the understanding was of the underlying facts. And and in this case, you can't do it because you've already set in stone. Yeah, what 
the premise of the Book of Mormon is. And so it's just in revealed problem. scripture. And, and yeah. And 150 years of yeah. prophets, seers, and revelators. Yeah. 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 It's just, it's a problem. And so um, okay, if we go to the next one, yeah. it's going to kind of hit this a little harder. So um, in Ether 2, God told the Jaredites that he would send them to that quarter where there had never, never man been uh, to a land of promise reserved for a righteous people. That is, um, that, that, that's the money quote. Cause, it is. Because, because we know that there were people living here 16,000 years ago for sure. Yeah. Like 23 and me says uh, that the like huge populations of native, uh, of migrations started 16,000 years ago. And then you have the Jaredites 2000 years ago and God telling them, no one, no man has lived in, in, in this land, the one yep. that I'm going to take you to. Yep. And so it's just, it is what it's right there. And then Helaman, it says, and it came to pass that they did multiply and spread and did go from the land southward to the land northward and did spread in so much that they began to cover the face of the whole earth from the sea south to the sea north, from the sea west to the sea east. So again, they're saying that population is what populated the Americas. There, there's no other, you know, mm. there, nowhere do they mention another population. And then in first Nephi, um, and it came to pass that we did find upon the land of promise as we journeyed in the wilderness that there were beasts in the forest of every kind, both the cow and the ox and the ass and the horse and the goat and the wild goat and all manner of wild animals, which were for the use of men. So again, it's just showing there's all these things that they describe being here except for other people. And so, again, <laughs> if you if you want to claim there's not other people, the text is telling you the exact opposite. You can't make that claim without dealing with this. And, and just to say, you know, again, the apologists will say, well... The Book of Mormon prophets probably weren't as concerned about other civilizations, so they didn't write about them. It's like no, because they're writing about animals they find. They're writing about all of these things they find. You, you, and, and not only that, but oh, and they, I, about the plates of the Jaredites that they find, right? Yeah, like, exactly. And, and pick pick any part in the history that we have, the recorded history, where there's a large population that spreads across an entire continent and doesn't have interactions and wars with outside people. It just doesn't happen. And so, this this is just we have to hit this now because it, it really shows how. The apologetics are basically trying to create a solution for a problem, but the problem, it's just too well set to now say that we can change what the Book of Mormon really says. It, the Book yeah. of Mormon is pretty clear here. Yeah. All right. And so the next slide is, uh, if you want to say the Book of oh, wait, Mormon. Gerardo wants to say something. I just oh, had ahead. a question because I've heard apologists saying that the Mulekites are an example of another, puppy, another uh, like, tribe or, or people that were here. Are we going to get to that? If we're going to get uh, to that well, later. Kind of, the Mulekites are still from the same place. So, I mean, the problem is like, even if you want to say that you'd still find DNA from that same place, like it'd be like if, uh, you know, you lived in Utah and someone's like, I have, I can't find any markers that are specifically to Utah. And you're like, well, this other person who lived in Provo was also who came <laughs> a little earlier. You'd be like, well, that's still Utah. You know what I mean? Like the Mulekites are still coming from the same people. Mm. Um, I'm trying to think. I, Just because they had a I different think, name doesn't mean they're an entirely different Well, it's, it's it, Yeah, because the right? Mulekites are coming from, isn't that coming from one of King Zedekiah's sons or something like that, yeah, right? Yeah. So you, you could still track the DNA just as easily because you know where they're coming from. So even that wouldn't really help you because it's not, you know what I mean? You'd still find, you'd find that maybe, but you can't find that either because- you're still coming from the same place. and Yeah. I'm I need to add to the point of like, why are they mentioning the Mulekites, but they're not mentioning the Maya or right, the exactly, Aztecs. Exactly. Like, yeah. Yeah. So you're going to mention the Mulekites, but you can't mention the fact that there's <laughs> this population that's so large, it's going to swallow you up eventually. It makes, yeah. it, it, it defies logic. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so going beyond the Book of Mormon, let's listen to what Joseph Smith had to say about how the Americas were populated. Cause this is really important. In this important and interesting book, the history of ancient America is unfolded from its first settlement by a colony that came from the Tower of Babel at the confusion of languages to the beginning of the fifth century of the Christian era. We are informed by these records that America in ancient times has been inhabited by two distinct races of people. The first were called Jaredites and came directly from the Tower of Babel. The second race came directly from the city of Jerusalem about, about 600 years before Christ. They were principally Isra Israelites of the descendants of Joseph. The Jaredites were destroyed about the time that the Israelites came from Jerusalem, who succeeded them in the inheritance of the country. The principal nation of the second race fell in battle toward the close of the fourth century. The remnant are the Indians that now inhabit this country. So Joseph Smith is telling you, these are the only people that were in America. Absolutely, without question, wow. the Native Americans are the remnant. And again, so if you want to say the Book of Mormon is confused, this is Joseph Smith. He's receiving... Um, 
and um, revelation from God as to who the Lamanites are. There's no ambiguity here. He is making it very clear. There was no one else here first. And every Indian is a direct descendant from the um, Book of Mormon times. So there's just, there's nothing. There's, there's nothing here you could take and say, okay, this can make uh, the apologetics work that there, there was other civilizations. It just doesn't exist. And just so people aren't confused, the date there. The date there says yes. 2002. That's from the but, enzyme that it came from. Yeah. So but it's the from Wentworth the letter would have been what, like 18, 40, 1830s, 40s, early. Yeah. Late 30s, something like that. 38 or something. I'm trying to think, but yeah. And, so, and uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's really clear. And this is Joseph writing to somebody else answering those questions. Yeah. And so there's just, again, there's, there's no way around it. And so now we have the book of Mormon telling us we have Joseph Smith who, even if you want to say he was just translating the book of Mormon, would be getting all these revelations at the same time concurrently. So he's got the exact same position. So there's, there's just no ambiguity. And um, so let's go to the next one, because this will be kind of the trifecta here, which is to say that God himself through the revelations is going to make the same argument. So he says in DNC so this, 54. Yeah. Doctrine and covenants, uh, yeah. Yeah, DNC 54. And thus you shall take your journey into the regions westward, unto the land of Missouri, unto the borders of the Lamanites. So this DNC God, that's God saying wow. that Lamanites are in Ohio because he's they end up sending missionaries to Ohio, right? I th yeah, because well, Ohio is the mountain, so I think they do. I know Missouri, Missouri is the one. Ohio. Uh, I think I think that particular one I think is for Missouri because I think that's where they. He's telling. Uh, well, yeah, he says Missouri in that one. But yeah, I mean the whole belief is that. Mm. Every Native American is a Lamanite because well, and there was no one else here. If if the church, if the brethren really believe that this was coming from God, why are they not sending geneticists to go to Missouri and test, you know, the, the <laughs> Native Americans, the Native that, Americans come that come out of Missouri? Yeah. Yeah. Because God is telling them where the Lamanites are. Yeah. Yeah. That's just it. We're, we're being told exactly where to look and we look and it's wrong. And so <laughs> at that point, where do you go? The Book of Mormon is making it clear. Joseph Smith's making it clear. God's making it clear through Joseph Smith. And yeah. so there's, there's boom, you know, three things where you just, you can't get around it. There's no way to get around it without yeah, it's, it's changing Bo the Book of Mormon. It's Book of Mormon. It's Doctrine and Covenants. It's Joseph Smith himself. Yeah. And it's every prophet, seer, and revelator between Joseph Smith and Spence W. And Kibble. God. Yeah. And God. <laughs> yeah. God. And God. I mean, Jesus, it's, just, God. it's just not ambiguous. And it's, it's frustrating when, when they try to tell you there's some other way to read the Book of Mormon because it's just, they're shutting the door on that when it's written. I mean, it's just, it's so clear. And so... Let's read the last few of those real quick, and then we'll move on. So DNC 19, uh, which is my word to the Gentile that soon it may go to the Jew of whom the Lamanites are a remnant. So again, they're saying Native Americans come from, you know, from the Jewish population. Um, DNC 3, and this testimony shall come to the knowledge of the Lamanites and the Lemuelites and the Ishmaelites who dwindle in unbelief because of the iniquity of their fathers. And DNC 28, and now behold, I say unto you that you shall go unto the Lamanites and preach my gospel unto them. Wow. So again... Remember, the Book of Mormon is about converting the Lamanite back to Christ. And so mm -hmm. God's telling them where to find him. He's telling them to go to the Native Americans. And so if there were other populations and the Lamanites somehow were swallowed up, then God would know that there's no Lamanites to preach to. So God thinks they're Lamanites. Joseph Smith thinks they're Lamanites. The Book of Mormon thinks it. And DNA tells us no. And, and so you either have to say DNA is all wrong. And that's a, a, an, it's an area you could go, except you're going to be hit really hard because of the fact that DNA has been tested over and over again, or you have to say, this is wrong. I, I don't know what else to say because these are really tangible truth claims being made. And that's why I would consider this a smoking gun because they make truth claim after truth claim about this specific thing. And it's proven false. And they didn't know at the time we'd have DNA, but now we do. And it, it, there's no way around it. Yeah. So if you go, if, if we could go and if we could take a DNA test, to the Native Americans in Missouri and Ohio and sample them, we know that 99.8% of their genes, if not more, would show a direct uh, descendants from Asia. Yeah. So right. if, if God, if God was sending um, the missionaries there, right. If, if God was telling Mormon missionaries to go there 98.9% or whatever of the native Americans were, were the wrong people. Well, but the, the missionaries other... were preaching to the wrong people only like at best one out of a hundred of the native Americans. But even the one, that one out of a hundred, we know where they came from and it's not the middle East. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. yeah. Then that's the thing. And it's, it's like, you know, one of those things, I guess, to put it into, to date this episode to, to 2022, it's like, you know, we are told that, 
the Lamanites were the Native Americans. And now we're told that DNA says, well, they're among them. So we don't quite know who the Lamanites are. And it's just like this past April, we're told the you know, prophet seers and revelators are saying, we don't know who Heavenly Mother is, so don't ask. They don't even know who the Lamanites are. So, I mean, how could you expect them to know who Heavenly Mother is if they can't tell you who the Lamanites are, who are the, the entire purpose of the Book of Mormon is to convert them and they don't know who they are. That's a problem. And it's yeah. one of those things that they were so sure of until science proved them false. And we're going to have more of those as we continue this series because you know the church realizes that this is real when they change the introduction. If they truly believed the science was wrong, they would have dug their heels and said, no, we're keeping it as it is because we know from, from the word of God, this is the case. They changed it. And I realize those aren't directly off the gold plates. That's a huge admission to the world to say, you know what? We didn't have yeah. this one quite right. Yeah, because that, that part, the, far, the fact that the Book of Mormon is written for the Lamanites, that's part yep. of the Book of Mormon plates. Yep, it is. Like it's not a Br- Br- Bruce R. McConkie invention. That's like what Moroni yeah. or Mormon yep. supposedly wrote in there. Do you, yep. do, you, do you include that little description of who the Book of Mormon was written for? Do you have that in these slides, Mike? I don't have Gerardo, that I'm going to have you look that up because yeah. it's so important. Because think about this. The, the, the Book of Mormon is supposed to be another witness of Jesus Christ. It's supposed to be the keystone of our religion. And literally, the, the, the title page that Gerardo's about to look up says who it's primarily yeah. written for. It's not primarily written for white, you know, you know white Americans of, of British descent. Right. Or it would have said that. We are literally the Gentiles. It's primarily written for the, the children of Israel who are supposed to be the Native Americans or the Lamanites, but now that we know that um, now that we know that they are not the Native Americans, who's the Book of Mormon written for? We don't know. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead and read it, Rado. It, it, it's here. It says, "Wherefore it is an abri-, and this is uh, Mormon talking. Wherefore it is an abridgment of the record of the people of Nephi and also of the Lamanites." written to the Lamanites who are a remnant of the house of Israel and also to the Jew and Gentile written by, and it says they're a remnant of the house of Israel. So when, when uh, the Lamanites are a remnant that I, I didn't know that because apologists are trying to say today, Oh, we don't know what Lehi's DNA was, but they're telling us right. Like Mormon is telling us right here, they're part of the house of Israel. So we do yeah. know what their DNA would look like. And also to Jew and Gentile, written by way of commandment and also by the spirit of prophecy and revelation. But that's secondary. We're secondary. Jew and Gentile, we're, yeah. we're secondary. Primarily, it's the it's the Native Americans. And now we yep. don't even know who the Lamanites are. Makes and no sense. It. And, and, and not to hammer on this, but I try really hard to, to point out through these overviews episodes we're doing, how they all connect back to other problems. And look at the last episode on the 116 pages. We're told... God knew 2,400 years in advance that Joseph Smith was going to let Martin Harris take the pages and lose them. So he created a second set of plates. And so he made all of these changes. God made all of these preparations for this one little event he knew was going to happen. And yet you're going to read the Book of Mormon and you're going to read the prophets and you're going to realize God made no um, adjustments when the Book of Mormon was written for the fact that the Lamanite population was going to be swallowed up and unrecognizable. We were going to all of a sudden not know who they were. Yeah, the, I mean, that's the, just for like 200 years, this. we'd know who they were. Yep. And then all of a sudden we wouldn't know who they were. Yep. Where's the, where's the scriptural sort of like support that God saw this coming and he had a way out. Yeah. And where's it, Gerardo? Because, where is it? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so we'll continue on because it, okay. like I said, this is going to be highly on the essay because of the fact that the problem is pretty obvious, but these verses are showing that Joseph Smith, revelations from God, are showing that there were other populations um, in the Book of Mormon in the Americas. And then once DNA kind of showed that Americas yeah. were not populated from Jerusalem, this really sent apologists looking for a solution, not based on the evidence, but based on something that could make it work. And um, this is a quote from uh, Apostle Mark Peterson, who has a lot of uh, very lovely quotes out there, if you've <laughs> ever come across him. But he says, and this, this is so great, because he says this in 1981 before DNA testing. He says, if there had been large numbers of other peoples here when the Jaredites came or when Lehi arrived, certainly the Book of Mormon would have said so. Hmm. The land was reserved for the Lord's purposes and for his people, and the Book of Mormon provides their histories. I mean, and he's right. Mark Peterson here is right. If the if there were people if there were populations even of their own size or bigger, they would have mentioned it, and they don't because the thought at the time was 
and we'll get into a little more in future episodes, but the Mal Mildred myth was this idea that there was this white race that was overtaken by the savage Indians, savage, Indi- savage Indians eradicated the white people and they lived here until the European settlers. Yeah. This is the worldview of Joseph Smith that he puts into the book of Mormon with no exit ramp for the possibility that there were other populations. They're, they it's textually it's, it's just not there. Yeah. And apologists today, fair Mormon, they're all contending with apostle Mark Peterson. And they God, <laughs> and God, and Joseph Smith, and the yeah. Book of Mormon itself. So yeah. Mark yeah. Mark Peterson is is a, a machine for for re- memorable quotes. But yeah, so I mean, <laughs> but he's right. In this case, he's right. It would be in there if if there was any textual evidence that there were other populations. It would be in the Book of Mormon, and it's not. And and that tells you all you need to know. And yeah. so um, we're going to start getting into the apologetic responses now. And like I said, the the problem is is really pretty straightforward because the DNA studies have been done over and over and over. And as John mentioned earlier, you know, I, I mentioned a lot smoking guns versus death by a thousand cuts. And this is one area I would fully say is a smoking gun because it's a tangible truth claim that we can test with science that has been tested and 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 questioned over and over and over again. And the technology is getting better and better. And so this is not something where we've stopped looking. This is something where they're looking every single day to get drill further and further in. And that's why um, I've done 23 and me. And it sounds like Gerardo, you have two. Yeah. And so you do 23 and me. And I did mine, I think three or four or five years ago in every month, maybe, maybe even sooner, they'll say, Hey, by the way, we can now test to see if you have a weird taste when you eat a certain food. Because they're starting to get these markers yeah. that they can test against your existing DNA. So I get updates every couple of weeks of new things they can test my DNA from years ago against. Yeah. So the technology is just getting better and, and better. There is no ambiguity here. Nothing is changing for the picture with regards to the Book of Mormon people. And uh, shout out to Doug Vincent who paid for for me to do 23 and Me. But I also did this company. Oh, you did it! Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, Somos Ancestria. You can just copy the the information from from twenty three and Me, and it tells me. Uh, I mean, I'm forty nine to fifty percent uh, Native American. Uh, temper and from that, fifty percent tells me that I'm twenty six percent Nahua, ten percent Maya, six percent Mixteca, uh, and tells me all this like Mexican, you know, like uh, Native American tribes and. Um, no Lamanite in here. <laughs> yeah, no that's layman. surprising. No Lamanite. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, and that's just it. I mean, it's not there, and so. But but it does. Is there some indication uh, of Asia? Does it? Yeah. Well, it tell twenty three and me tells you like all this like this forty nine percent or fifty percent. Okay. Uh, it comes from Asia okay. sixteen thousand yeah. years ago. Yeah. 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 Okay. But, and that's yeah. amazing too because it gives you some time frames too. It's not just yeah. percentages. It gives you a lot of detail. Yeah. yeah. And so we're going to start now kind of hitting more into the apologetics. And um, on the next slide, it kind of talks again about basic principles of population genetics suggest the need for a more careful approach to the data. The conclusions of genetics, like those of any science, are tentative, and much work remains to be done to fully understand the origins of the native populations of the Americas. Nothing is known about the DNA of the Book of Mormon peoples. But really quickly, and, really quickly, this is, yeah. uh, we should have warned people, this is a quote from the essay, Gospel Topics essay. Yes, it's from the essay. And it's clearly designed to uh, shrink the target and to cause people to question the validity of DNA yeah. tests, right? It's just it one that creates plausible deniability and to, to create a, a fog of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Well, and the thing is saying tentative is true. Like science does change, but we see that all the time when you're talking about medical stuff. When you're talking about, the problem is when you talk about tentative, you're making the implication that the whole picture can change. And as we've heard from geneticists on, on your, again, I highly recommend the the old uh, older podcast they had done when the essay came out. They go through like the stuff that changes is so small and, and, and it's not changing the picture. It's just changing. Maybe instead of saying people arrived in America 24,000 years ago, maybe it's 30,000 years ago. It's not saying, oh, they didn't actually come until, you know, the Jaredites came. And so yeah. there's nothing here to tell us that. And then um, I, I don't mean to, to sound like I'm being pejorative here. Uh, when they say nothing is not about the DNA of the Book of Mormon people, that's one, it's, it's not true. But two, the Book of Mormon people are not historically real because the story has no historical foothold. So that's kind of a, a tricky statement for them to make. But the thing yeah. is, we do know a lot about what we would expect from the DNA of people described in the Book of Mormon because we get a lot of information as to where they would be coming from. Right. 
Yeah. Yeah, I'm just trying to imagine if, uh, you know, if if one of the apostles had a, a polyp on their colon and they needed a colonoscopy, right? whether they would go, well, science isn't always definitive. You know, science well, could be yeah, wrong. That's just it. Uh, and, would and, they, would yeah. they though? Or would they go, okay, doctor, I'm going to get my polyp removed so I don't get colon cancer. Like it's convenient to like backtrack on the you know well on the reliability of science when it's it is there but then if you think about dna as a science and how like it's enough to pe- put people in jail right exactly if it's, it's enough, enough people to take people out of jail exactly right? if it's enough for that like how t- how 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 tentative is is it really yeah yeah and not only that but i mean when you talk about population genetics and we'll get into that a little bit more but but you know, we're not, you're, yeah. you're, you're not just saying the DNA says this. So we mm-hmm. say, so you're saying the DNA says it and it's backed up by migrations. It's backed up by the history we have. It's not just DNA. That's telling us where people are coming from. Yeah. Like I said earlier in this, they knew that the native Americans likely came from Asia before DNA confirmed it because they had some of the archeological evidence um, with the Bering Straits. So DNA actually confirmed what they already thought, mm-hmm. which is a really important note to say that this is confirming a lot of other fields of study. It's not sitting on an island all by itself. And we're just forcing that as the only conclusion. This is actually working with everything else, as opposed to with Book of Mormon studies, where you'd have to, again, you know, I keep saying it, but jam that square hole in a circle peg because it doesn't fit with anything else that we're doing. And that's really the problem is one side fits, it meshes, it works. We can see it with our own eyes. We can understand it. And on the other side, we're just saying, because we grew up believing this, we have to keep believing it. So we're going to basically make everything else fit with it, even though it doesn't fit. And that, yeah. to me, that's the difference between working off of science and being willing to, like science is willing to change. Science is willing to say, we got this wrong. Here's the adjustment to this particular part of DNA. Whereas with the Book of Mormon, it's just like, no, this is our claim. We're not moving off of it because we can't. And, and that's a big difference that people... I realize we always say it, but it's you have to really be able to internalize that when you're looking at these issues, especially if you're a believer, to be willing to say, if the what evidence do I need to be willing to change, excuse me, to change my position? Because if the answer is there's no evidence, then really you're just you're not and this isn't really the place for you. This isn't the discussion for you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah beautiful. Um, and so if we go to the next one. Um, this is a quote from your episode um, with Jamie Hannes Handy, who, by the way, I, I'd never met her either, but she was awesome on that episode and, and was just so the way she described this stuff was so helpful to me, especially early on, because I was so um, unaware of any of the DNA stuff and listening to her explain it. And, you know, Simon was on the episode and I'm so upset. I can't remember the third person. He was not a, a, a member of the church. But anyway, she was a, kind of describing why DNA has evolved and it's not changing the Book of Mormon's outlook for being his- historical. And she said, if you're looking at DNA in, in Book of Mormon and the eth- ethnic long-term history of indigenous populations, the picture is just like lo- watching a photo load, right? It starts blurry. It starts to get clear. It starts to get clear. And we are just getting clearer and clearer. And it is still not jiving. So what she's saying is DNA is getting more and more technical. And every time we do that, it's getting a higher resolution picture. And every time the picture gets a higher resolution, it's telling us more and more about different DNA profiles of of all the people in the world. And every time we do that, it still is not making the Book of Mormon better. It's 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 just telling us over and over again. If if anything, it's making it worse. Yeah, exactly. It's just telling us over and over again. This is not this did not happen. There's this idea that every time science advances, Mormonism shrinks. And you'll yeah, see true. that with the flood. You'll see that with the Tower of Babel. You'll yeah. see that with DNA in the Book of Mormon. You'll see that with the Book of Abraham. Every single yeah. time history or science expands, Mormonism shrinks. And it's, it's true. And it's out of necessity. I get it. But it's just one of those things where it's just it's not intellectually consistent or honest to try to say that it could work if we redefine what the Book of Mormon says. Because again, I said this, I think I've said this in a few episodes now, but every time I look at these sources, I take them at face value. I don't take them at, how do I need this to work? And and, and there's a difference. And um, we don't need to get into this now, but Carrie Molstein, who is one of the Egyptologists for the church, gave a presentation for Fair Mormon. And I, I don't have the full quote off the top of my head, but he basically says, I start with the assumption that the Book of Mormon is true and anything that comes from the church is true. And then I fit the evidence I get into that paradigm. And you can do that. And, and to a certain extent, if you do that in every, the start of every Enzyme article, you write, we're starting with the conclusion the church is true. So everything you read here is under that paradigm. That's honest. But they're presenting it in a way that's trying to say, scientifically, we can make this work or at least give a plausibility. But to do so, you're basically trying to knock down so many of the foundational discoveries we've made 
in order to preserve beliefs that are just not tethered to a historical backbone. Right. Yeah. So this next, uh, this next quote you're going to be reading is an example of the church trying to shrink, shrink both the Lamanites and the geography to a super tiny area because the smaller they can make the population and the smaller they can make the geography, then the harder it is to find the DNA you want to find. Yes. Right? Or you would expect to find. Yeah, and that's exactly what this is. So this next part is, again, from the Gospel Topics essay. The Book of Mormon provides little direct information about cultural contact between the people as it describes and others who may have lived nearby. Consequently, most early Latter-day Saints assume the the Near Easterners or West Asians like Jared, Lehi, Mulek, or their companions were the first or the largest or even the only groups to settle the Americas. Building upon this assumption, critics insist that the Book of Mormon does not allow for the presence of other large populations in the Americas and that, therefore, Near Eastern DNA should be easily identifiable among modern Native groups. And yeah, I mean, they're right. I have to just respond. Where did Mormons get that idea? Yeah, that's just it. I mean, (laughs) well, it's just the critics and... It's oh, not the critics. The critics. It's, it's it's God on Doctrine and Covenants telling <laughs> yeah. Joseph to go to it's Missouri. It's Joseph, it's God, it's Jesus, yeah. it's the Book of Mormon itself. It's yeah, that's just the it. Doctrine I mean, and at some point. <laughs> <laughs> they're not being honest they're about it. They're not being honest. They're trying no. to hide the fact that prophets, seers, and revelators and scripture got it wrong for 200 years. That's just it. That's, and again, if they were honest, know. they would just admit that. Yeah, at this point, it's just one of those things where it's like to try to, to offload the blame for this onto to critics is, isn't, is just nonsensical because again, you know, they kind of say, you know, most early Latter-day Saints, you know, but it's like, no, they were, they believed it because they were told that by people who claim to be prophets. This is not something that people just decided one day and they read the book of Mormon and said, I know, I know what they're I know what they're trying to say. It's no Joseph Smith, as we read earlier, was telling them exactly who the native Americans are. The book of Mormon they believed it. The book, the of, book Mormon of Mormon told them who the native yeah. Americans were. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we already it, proved it, that. Yeah. God, God said it. Like, I just can't <laughs> yeah. get over that. It's not critics. It's, like, it's no, God. it's not critics That's like poisoning and the that's well. To just throw yeah. the word critics in there yeah. is yeah. just a way to poison the well, I think. And not only that, but when they when they use the word critics, they're making it too. They're, they're, they're offloading that, that term onto it. Like if you're a believing member and you are looking for this DNA and you're, you're upset because you're not finding it and it's troubling you, they're now throwing the word critic onto you. So they're basically saying, if you follow this same line yep. of thought, you are therefore a critic. And, and I think, again, yeah. these, are, these essays are word, written very carefully. And so those words are not just thrown in there, you know, haphazardly. And so to, to yeah. use the word critic is, yeah, it's to diminish not just the people bringing it up, but it's also to keep people who are reading this essay who do have questions uh, in, in the back of their mind to know that the church is viewing that they are uh, looking at these members as being critical as well. And, and so you got to keep that in mind. And, and it does oftentimes accomplish that task. And so we, we covered this earlier, um, but the reason the Book of Mormon provides little direct information about cultural contact between the peoples it describes and others who may have lived by, as the essay says, is because there's none. And, and, and the point is, <laughs> why, would, why would anyone expect there to be any information um, such as that when it was meant to be clear that the Book of Mormon's Lamanites were the ancestors of the Native American. Like, not only does it not describe it, but why would anyone even expect there to be it? Because it wouldn't, if there was that kind of a description, you would have to rewrite the whole story because you wouldn't just throw that out there and then just, you know, leave it. And so the fact that it's not there, no one expects there to be because it doesn't fit the story or what the leaders were teaching about it anyways. Yeah, that's funny that they say little direct information about cultural contact between people. Yeah. Well, there's none. It's not little. Yeah. It's it's none. Literally, yeah. There's none. It doesn't mention any. Yeah, I mean, and so they would say little because they probably, like you said, the Milokites, but that doesn't fit because it's still from the same place. So that would not, right. in any way, accomplish their need to find a way for the Book of Mormon people to intermingle with people who were from East Asia. Yeah. Yeah, that's a problem. Well, so now we're going to kind of go into their section of the apologetics with DNA and kind of the different areas of that, and so. I already did this earlier, but I just want to recommend it's three geneticists respond to the LDS essay on DNA in the Book of Mormon. Um, it's audio only, but like I said, it's such a good listen. And um, it really takes what seems like an overly complex topic and makes it consumable for people like me who obviously have no background in, in science and genetics. But um, just again, it's a shout out to them and to, to John for that episode because it was very helpful to me. And I just want to throw that out there before we get going, because a lot of the explanations kind of come from them um, because they, they explained it so well. Excellent. And um, 
you know, we, we talked about this earlier, but from the essay, it says a brief review of the basic principles of genetics will help explain how scientists use DNA to study ancient populations. It will also highlight the difficulty of drawing conclusions about the Book of Mormon from the study of genetics. And so right away, they're trying to tell us, to, you know, they're, they're trying to tell the members what science can do and what science can't do. And so they're calling it tentative. They're saying that it's limited. They're saying it can't draw conclusions about the Book of Mormon. Um, I just, I think at some point they're trying so hard to poison the well here. So when you leave this essay, you just go, yeah, I can see why there's some issues, but obviously we'll get there someday. We'll find it out later. You know, the evidence is just around the corner. Yeah. Well, um, the problem. Gerard is dying to jump in. Yeah, jump in. <laughs> the problem, Mike, is not, it's not that we can't draw a conclusion from science. The problem is that we already have the conclusion given to exactly. us by God and the Book of Mormon. Yep. And then that would have that conclusion that we already have that we've been we've been given by God. And it's like science would would prove that, right? Yeah. So they're saying, oh, science can't conclude that the Book of Mormon is true. Well, the problem is like we have the conclusion. We have exactly. what it's supposed to be. And yep. science is not proving that. In fact, it's disproving the conclusion. Yep. Another way that's to look at it. this would be, let's just say we we knew what, you know, uh, Middle Eastern DNA looked like. Let's just say we knew that. And we probably do. We do. Okay. Yeah. So, and then let's just say that when we did the DNA tests of Native Americans, it was a perfect match. It's like, oh my gosh, all the Native Americans have the same DNA as the ancient Israelites. Yep. Is there any of us who seriously think the church would go, well, don't make too yeah. much of that. Don't yeah, make too much of that because science can, of course the church yeah. would like spike the football, you know, shake their legs, like we're number yeah. one and yeah. tell the whole world the church was true and that science <laughs> proved it. But because yeah. science says the opposite, what are they doing? They're basically trying to devalue science or devalue the validity yeah. of DNA evidence, right? Yeah, yeah. that's just it. Yeah, it's it, yeah. I mean, that, that's one hundred percent right. And so, I mean, look what they uh, do with chiasmus, which is like yeah. the world's worst <laughs> apologist genetics or, ever. Or well, Nahum, the three right. three letter yeah. three yeah. letter. Yeah. Another one where you're just like you're trying to you're trying to to, to to fit the conclusion to the evidence, and in this case, the evidence is so overwhelming that you had to change your introduction, and yet it was it was overwhelming enough to where you change your introduction, but at the same time, you're not willing to back off whatsoever from the historicity of the Book of Mormon, which they're going to have to do eventually, but. In this case, they're yeah, they're just attacking the messenger. And yeah. so this one is from our annotated essay. And this is an example that was done by Kellen when he did it. And I love it because it, it makes sense. So I'm going to read you um, an example that basically mirrors the DNA problem for the Book of Mormon, except it's not from the church's point of view. And I want you guys to think of what you would, how you'd respond. So let's imagine that the senior director of NASA once claimed that the moon is made of green cheese. But when astronauts landed, they found none. The obvious conclusion would be that the moon is not, nor was it ever made of green cheese. Now, suppose NASA hired some lunar apologists to write an essay to explain away this embarrassing discrepancy. This essay would consist of a series of convoluted explanations and arguments about how, although today we know the moon is made of minerals, we should nevertheless give credence to the, dir to the director's authoritative claim that the moon's chemistry was once predominated by dairy products. They would then proceed to give you several hypotheses about how the cheese might have transmitted into something else or otherwise disappeared. They would then use some sciencey talk to help you feel comfortable that people smarter than you are on top of the cheese problem and that if you just change your expectations about what the NASA director actually meant by green and cheese, you'll be able to satisfy yourself that the complete absence of cheese is somehow just what the really smart people should have been expecting all along and that you should never let your personal feelings inform your belief about the long ago presence of moon cheese. You might even be shamed for naively, naively, naively expecting to find cheese on the moon today and criticized for lacking the faith to believe it was really there when the director made the claim. Yeah, it's, it's more like, but, but they would also go, well, okay, we never said that the whole moon was made of green cheese. <laughs> yeah, and there's that too. There's, it, you know, it's just that where, where they actually took the samples you know, there, there yep. wasn't, but if you, if they had gone to a different part of the moon, yep. <laughs> then they would have found the green cheese there, but they didn't, they went to the wrong part. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And it's just, I mean, like <laughs> I said, saying, it's a silly like, example. Yeah. The but... fact that the astronauts like found minerals, we can't draw too many conclusions from that. Yeah. Cause what is cheese <laughs> and the yeah. cheese would have deteriorated over time. <laughs> and so now the dust that would be there, yeah, look, we don't know be. what, we don't know what cheese looked like back when it was actually made of cheese. <laughs> Yep. Plus the erosion of cheese over time. <laughs> yeah, that's just it. And again, it's 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 meant to be silly, but the whole point is if you read this essay 
and you went to somebody else and we've talked about this in other episodes and you replace the church, any marker to, to knowing it's the church in the book of Mormon. And you said it was another religion and that the leader of the religion mm. made some claim. It was proven false. And this is how they're trying to tell you it could still be plausible. Yeah. Any believing member who doesn't quite already understand what you're trying to do here would go, Oh yeah, they're making it up because you know, the over the evidence is so overwhelming. Yeah. And so in this essay, they're just, they're trying to basically make all of these different um, conclusions about what science can and can't do and what it can and can't say. And they're doing it in a way that would just, it would never pass peer review and they know it. And so they put this out here in this very carefully worded um, essay. Um, and this is the best they have. And so that's why I wanted to cover this essay predominantly because it really is the best um, arguments the church has to offer. And more importantly, these are the arguments the church is willing to put out um, so that's why I didn't want to cover like some of the people maybe who are making arguments that are maybe a little bit more out there. This is the most standard apologetic they have. And so um, this is when as, they start as to honest question, as they know how to be. Yeah. I mean, pretty much. Yeah. This is, yeah. this is, um, I would argue this is like as honest as they feel like they can be. Um, <laughs> without ruining the church, to, without completely ruining the church. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and I think that they, they know how far they can go before they, they risk, you know, telling too much and also be willing to say, well, we still told you guys what we knew. And, um, so they say at the present time, scientific consensus. Okay, wait, what holds, is this quote? This is, this, from, this is the about, from the, this is from the essay and it's about dating the arrival of people to America. Okay. And, um, this is apologetics. Not, this is apologetics. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is from the church's uh, essay. And so it says at the present time, scientific consensus holds that the vast majority of native Americans belong to the sub branches of the Y chromosome haplogroup C and Q14 and the mitochondrial DNA haplogroups A, B, C, D, and X, all of which are predominantly East Asia. Um, and then the, the footnote that they have here just basically confirms that native Americans arrived uh, long before the book of Mormon would have been, you know, happened anyways. Um, and then they say, but the picture is not entirely clear. Continuing studies provide new insights and some challenges uh, in some challenge previous conclusions. For example, a 2013 study states that as much as one third of Native American DNA originated anciently in Europe or West Asia and was likely introduced into the gene pool before the earliest migration to the Americas. This study paints a more complex picture than is suggested by the prevailing opinion that all Native American DNA is essentially East Asian. And if you go to that the next sounds slide, that sounds promising. <laughs> yeah, oh, they're that sounds really good. West so Asian. Now I'm just, I'm interested. Yep. And so, basically, this is why when I talk about apologetics needing to be consistent, this is a good example because if you take the 2013 study at face value, it destroys the historicity of not just the Book of Mormon but Adam and Eve because they're literally telling you that this DNA was introduced long before the Book of Mormon mm. would have happened or Adam and Eve would have lived in Missouri. And so by creating point. this line of apologists, you're blowing up the Book of Mormon anyways. And so, But they don't mention okay. that. They don't mention that. And it's like – and they say before the earliest migrations because by saying that, it avoids saying – long before Book of Mormon times would have happened anyways. And so either way, that would not help their case because even if you could show DNA that came here, say 20,000 years ago, it wouldn't help the Book of Mormon in any possible way. And that study still is not consensus. That's still like finding um, one bit of information that you then extrapolate. You try to extrapolate to say, well, that means everyone has it. And it's not the case. The, the overwhelming DNA is still East Asian, but there are going to be uh, remnants. I think I think that might have been the study where they found like a bone or something like that, and they tested and they found some of that DNA. But even still, it's long before the Book of Mormon. So even if you want to do that, it still shows that the Book of Mormon. It doesn't help the Book of Mormon in any way possible. Is I guess what I'm saying. Yeah, if they were going to be honest, they would use that. They would cite that study and say, yeah. okay, this creates some a little bit of new information that they didn't have before. But in all fair, in all fairness, it completely destroys the doctrine and covenant <laughs> saying that yeah. that the earth is seven thousand years old, and it and it makes it so there was there was humans before Adam and Eve. It destroys the fall. It destroys yep. the garden. It destroys the Noah's flood, the Tower of Babel, which destroys yeah. the Bible and the Book of Mormon. And they just <laughs> fail to mention any of that. Yeah. That's the, and that's the problem. And that's why it's like, you gotta be, it's, you know, there's, there's those cartoons. Like when I was growing up, they'd be like Looney Tunes or something. And they'd say, maybe not Looney Tunes, but like Alvin and the chipmunks or somewhere. They'd say, you got to clean your room. And so there'd be this rug in the middle of the room. And so they'd shove everything under the rug. because they didn't want to actually clean it. And every time you push them under the rug, then another part of the rug would pop up. Right. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that's what this feels like. Cause every time you shove one part of apologetics under the rug, but you don't actually answer the underlying problem, it just pops up somewhere else. And so you think you solved the DNA, but then all of a sudden it's like, oh, wait, crap. I just completely demolished the entire premise that the Book of Mormon happened, you know, or or Adam and Eve, you know. Um, and, and so that's why I just want there to be consistency. When you make that claim, 
that DNA is okay because there might have been some introduction of non-Eastern um, Asian DNA before the earliest migration. You're talking 20, 30,000 years ago. You're not talking Book of Mormon times. And they know that. The study tells you that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. This re this reminds me of when Brian Hales tries to claim that Joseph Smith didn't have sex with any of his plural wives. But at the same time, the Book of Mormon says the whole point of polygamy is to raise a righteous seed. You can't make that argument that Joseph, there's no evidence for offspring and still believe the Book of Mormon. It, it's it's just, it's providing evidence in isolation that, that right. contradicts your evidence uh, or your arguments in all the other areas. It's yeah, dishonest. That's, and that's all it is. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Yeah. And so um, the next slide, it kind of talks about just how it, this essay continues to muddy the waters. And so um, the essay, the church's essay says, while near Eastern DNA markers do exist in the DNA of modern native, native populations, it is difficult to determine whether they are the result of migrations that predated Columbus, such as those described in the Book of Mormon, or whether they stem from genetic mis mixing that occurred after the European conquest. And um, this is what, actually, this is what um, Gerardo had mentioned earlier. So 99.6% of Native American DNA is from East, uh, from East Asia. The remaining 0.4% has been determined to be primarily Spanish and African post-colonization um, admixture. So Simon Southerton answered that question when he did the podcast with you guys way back when, which is to say, even if you, even if you want to say there's 0.4% remaining that we don't know about, it still does not match the Book of Mormon claims at all. And so the church here is using the little bit of ambiguity we have in the DNA to muddy the waters and say, we just can't know. And the problem is we can't. DNA, as Gerardo said earlier, when you get a 23andMe test, which is like 100 bucks now, not only do they tell you the areas that you're, you're uh, – population genetics come from, but they usually give you a pretty decent time frame as when they were there. And so this just isn't something now that we can't know either that we know both the place and the time. And so to, to muddy the waters is just saying, well, there might be this chance somewhere against all of the evidence. And I just think it, again, you wouldn't make that claim if it was the other way around and this was supporting you, you would, you would say, oh, this is, this is the most amazing evidence we've ever seen. But because it tells you that it, your claims are wrong, you're just saying, well, who knows what it really means? Got it. Um, and then just to keep going with this. So this is the whole thing. This is again from the essay. Scientists do not rule out the possibility of additional small scale, small scale migrations to the Americas. And the church is citing a National Geographic article, which is kind of an infamous one within yeah. Mormonism. And what the article talks about is a 24,000 year old Malta boy in Siberia. <laughs> There's already a problem 24,000 years ago, exactly. but, but keep so, going. <laughs> uh, who's, in this, whose DNA indicates that not only was he ancestral native Americans, but his uh, ancestors have roots in the near East. This is actually further evidence against the book of Mormon because it dates the uh, DNA of ancient America to 20,000 years before the book of Mormon times. So it could not possibly have come from the Jaredites or the Lehites and would also imply that the global flood never occurred because this DNA is going to continue uninterrupted until the populations come in modern times. So, I mean, again, you're making these claims and, and I, I'm pretty sure on the, on, on your um, essay from uh, with Jamie Han Hannah's handy, I think she actually said something like, are these people even reading what they're talking about? Because, you're citing this National Geographic art, and I get it. I still get it cited to me, like on Twitter and stuff, all the time today. Yeah. And I'm like, do you understand that if you want to take that claim, that the Book of Mormon, Adam and Eve, all of that immediately dies? So if you want to do that, you can, but you're you're, you're shooting yourself <laughs> in the foot. And most people don't understand that. They just see the headline or they see the little clip that the, someone will share on Facebook and say, see, we knew all along. They don't read it and they just keep spreading it. It's like, no, no, no. This actually makes it worse for you. You just don't realize it because you're not looking at the dating. And, and uh, you know, I, again, it's one of those things where it's like, I don't know, we don't really need to say more than that. It's just, yeah. if you're going to make that apologetic, you got to understand the implications of what you're saying. Totally. And yeah, well, there's so many problems with this because uh, there, the, the, the essay is citing this as it says small scale migrations, but the whole idea about the Jaredites and the, and the Lamanites and the Nephites is that they became huge huge populations right that yeah. cover the um, east north south west right. all the lands millions of soldiers right yeah right yeah and that's just it and so 
We're going to jump in now to some of the more specific things. And I'm going to try. Uh, oh, this is going actually. Sorry, I missed this one. I was going, looking through over here. For example, a 2010 genetic analysis of a well-preserved 4,000-year-old paleo Eskimo in Greenland led scientists to hypothesize that a group of people besides those from East Asia had migrated to the Americas. Now, what, what is that quote from? This is from the essay. Yeah, okay. And one of the things, and this is what uh, Kellen in our annotated essay put, this is actually a great attestation to the power of population genetics because this paleo Eskimo dates to Jaredite, Jaredite times, but their DNA leaves no mystery about where they came from. So what we're saying is in this case, we are able to find exactly where this person is from in a 4,000 year old skeleton. So mm. <laughs> they're actually kind of, again, showing mm. us how powerful and specific and good using DNA is. And so again, to, to the point in our annotated essay it says, what would be amazing in contrast would be if we had a Mesoamerican skeleton from Jaredite times with genetic material of mid or Middle Eastern origin, but that hasn't happened. And so the opposite is true, which makes you wonder why the church included this, because the church wants you to think this is proof that, you know, well, anything can happen, but it actually, they're giving us proof of how good and specific DNA can be. And that makes you go, well, then why haven't we found anything for the Book of Mormon if we can find it here? You know what I mean? Especially when you're talking about millions of people mm. across the United States. That's, that's a, a problem. It's a really, it's a really good point. Yeah, yeah. And so I think that's a really good point. And um, again, all throughout these essays, you just see these examples, and you're like, "Why are you putting them in here? It actually hurts you." <laughs> but it's because they well, know better. Well, they, they the game, better. the game they're playing, it's not a game of help members really understand the science and the context and right. what the probability is for the Book of Mormon being true. They literally just want to throw some PhDs and throw some jargon at the members with some specious arguments so that the Mormons go, oh, I don't understand all this. It's really technical. But as smart PhDs, you know, stand yeah. behind it. And these words all sound really technical. There must be good enough explanations. And now I don't have to worry about yeah, it. Yeah, I think that's what it is. It's like, what's the phrase? Smarter people than me have looked at it and they're okay with it. So I am too. And I, I, yeah. I think that's really what it boils down to. Yeah. And, and Again, like we said, for all these arguments to work and to even give like the smallest amount of possibility that the Book of Mormon could be true, you have to literally dismiss the whole foundation that we give in the first hour or 30, 40 minutes of this episode yeah. about God saying who the Lamanites are, about the Book of Mormon saying uh, that they spread through the land, that no one was here before. You have to literally throw that the whole foundation on the trash before you can start considering this arguments that the church are, is putting forward. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So now we're going to look at what they call the founder effect. And from the church's essay, it says, one reason it is difficult to use DNA evidence to draw definitive conclusions about Book of Mormon peoples is that nothing is known about the DNA that Sarah, or Lehi, Saraya, Ishmael, and others brought to the Americas. Even if geneticists had a database of the DNA that now exists among all American Indian groups, it would be impossible to know exactly what to search for. Um, it is possible that each member of the emigrating parties described in the Book of Mormon had DNA typical of the Near East, but it was likewise possible that some of them carried DNA more typical of other regions. In this case, their descendants might inherit a genetic profile that would be unexpected given their family's place of origin. This phenomenon is called the founder effect. And so what they're saying is, until you have the exact DNA from one of the Book of Mormon people, we don't know what to look for because we don't know who the founder of the civilization in America was. And... Um, let's just go straight to the next slide because this is easier just to kind of go straight into. Um, the Book of Mormon clearly tells us that Lehi's family were Israelites from Jerusalem. Is this essay asking us to consider that the Lehites might have actually been the descendants of Siberians who had relocated temporarily to Jerusalem before they built a ship and came to America? And the reason is just saying, like, we know where they're coming from. We know what to look for. And this is an article from, well, this essay was predating the the, the, the website change, but from LDS.org titled Who and Where are the Lamanites. And they explain in this composite group is the blood of Israel. For we know that Lehi was of the tribe, tribe of Manasseh, mm. that Ishmael was of Ephraim and that Mulek was of Judah being a descendant of King David through Zedekiah. So don't get sidetracked by the fact that they're saying we don't have the DNA to, to, to look for the, the founder <laughs> effect from the people coming off of the boat, because we're not using DNA profiling on individual, we're looking at population genetics, and that is a huge difference. And they're trying to kind of conflate the two, I think, to try to say, because we don't have, you know, Lehi's skeleton, we can't know. Um, and so if you want to believe the Book of Mormon is history, they tell you exactly where they're coming from, 
we know who one of the founders was, which we, you had mentioned earlier, Mulek, the son of King Zedekiah. That's a lineage that's known because we know where they were from. We know when they were from. What more could you ask for? This is so actually like we don't, almost too much. We don't have a saliva sample or a hail, <laughs> yeah. hair sample from Lehi, so we can't yep. know. And you're saying, well, we know what the people who lived in his time we know what their DNA would have looked like. Exactly. And right? so that's, and, and so to, to make that claim is just, it's muddying the waters and it's trying to say, well, maybe if we had that, they would actually show that they were from a different part of the world. But because we have different descriptions that are really specific from the Book of Mormon, we know exactly where they are. So again, you're, you're trying to throw out situ scenarios that just don't have any basis in the text of the Book of Mormon to say maybe there's a chance. But again, that just doesn't work if we're being intellectually honest with what we have to work with. So know? if God was smart enough to create multiple versions of the plates to fool Lucy Harris, wouldn't it have been cool if God had gotten Lehi to leave a saliva sample <laughs> or a hair sample? So the way Joseph is like exhuming the plates, there'd be the sword of Laban, there'd be the Urim and Thummim, there'd be all the different versions of the plates, and then a little test tube with a saliva sample or like a lock of hair, <laughs> Lehi, a lock of hair from Lehi. And then we could have just done the DNA test and known. You would think, I mean, yeah, and that's just it. It's just like, you know, again, it's like one we've talked about before, but the things Joseph Smith's in control of it makes, he gets his believers to make sense. But these things, he had no idea DNA was going to come in. So of course you wouldn't plan for it. He, the Book of Mormon doesn't plan for anything in the future. And we'll get to that again, but right. it's like all of this stuff. It plans up all the way to Joseph Smith. But it, not cleans up, it cleans yeah. up the messes. Yeah, it, exactly. Yeah. And it's, it's just, yeah, it's a mess. And so. Um, the next slide kind of makes this point a little bit more. And, and so we're talking about the founder effect still. And, um, in addition to the last slide, we know one of the reasons Lehi needed the brass plates was that they contained his genealogy. So the mm. book of Mormon tells us he was a descendant of Joseph. So there's no reason for the church to propose that we're trying to find <laughs> some weird offshoot where <laughs> they moved to some point. other area, then came in and then left, you know, we know exactly the genealogy and, and they make that a big reason to get the brass plates. And, and this is another one from, from Kellen who did the essay, but says, sure, we don't have the exact remains of Lehi's family to compare to, but that's a diversion because we know where Lehi's family came from. That's the whole reason that for $99, 23andMe can use your DNA to show where your ancestors came from, not because they dug up your great, great, great grandmother's <laughs> family, but because of the advancements in population genetics that tell us about their migrations going back to the Neanderthals. So again, if you want to believe that DNA is wrong and that all of the stuff on Neanderthals is just incorrect stuff, you can make that claim. But if we trust population genetics enough to do that to, I mean, my goodness, all sorts of medical advances, archaeological advances, all that stuff, then you cannot argue we don't know where the Book of Mormon people came from. They give you almost too much information. They almost make it too specific. So <laughs> we know exactly what to look for. It's, it's just way I, too specific. Yeah, it is. It, there's, it's, there's no ambiguity here. And um, yeah, and by the way, if you if you don't believe there's any validity to DNA testing, you should be working in the courts and the judicial system to make sure that yep. no one's ever put in jail because of DNA yep. testing or that no one's ever exonerated and let out of jail. That would be a huge injustice to the world. Yeah. Exactly. So if you're going to invalidate it wholesale, you, you've got a lot of social justice work to do, by the way. Yep. And that's the problem. <laughs> and so... Um, if we go to the next one, this is another one. This is from the essay as well from the church. And they say, consider the case of Dr. Hugo Perego, um, who's likely the author of the essay, a Latter-day Saint <laughs> population geneticist. His genealogy confirms that he is a multi-generation Italian, but the DNA of his paternal gen genetic lineage is from a branch of the Asian Native American haplogroup C. This likely means that somewhere along the line, a migratory event from Asia to Europe led to the introduction of DNA atypical of Perego's place of origin. If Perego and his family were to colonize an isolated landmass, future geneticists conducting a study of his descendant's Y chromosome might conclude that the original settlers of that landmass were from Asia rather than Italy. And again, this is silly because the DNA still shows the Italian lineage. So that's the problem. Like, even if like we're not arguing that the Book of Mormon is showing that um, the Israeli uh, the Jerusalem um, genealogy is out of order. We're saying it's non-existent. In this example, <laughs> it, the DNA is still showing his Italian lineage. It also shows the East Asian. So I, you know, it's like one of those things where it's like, why is the church trusting Dr. Prego's DNA story, but not the one that says that the Book of Mormon is not historical? Because again, this example makes our point. It's not that it's out of order. It's not that it's out of place. It's non-existent. And, and that's, that's the, that's the difference. We're not showing, you know, I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but it's not like Native American DNA is saying 
that there was this de, um, this these strains or these markers that left Jerusalem, but it just doesn't match the timing. It's they're not there, and so their example is making it sound like because it would be out of order with you know Italian versus Asian yeah. that they would confuse geneticists, and it might confuse them, but they would still know both of those places. It's just it's a bad example. You know what we need, Gerardo. You know how we have Michael Coe to talk about archaeology and anthropology. We've had uh, Robert Rittner come to talk about Book of Abraham and Egyptology. We just had a professor talk about Noah and the Flood, a geologist. We need a, a geneticist that isn't Simon Southerton, <laughs> who's never been Mormon, yeah. to come talk about genetics, the Book of Mormon and DNA. That would be good. Because sorry, why haven't we done that yet? Will you write that, that down? So what if he's right? Because Simon Southerton, well, he's like Mormon, even though he was a bishop. I mean, the weird thing is Simon Southerton was a bishop and a geneticist before he learned about these problems with DNA in the Book of Mormon. Yeah. yeah. So that should make him a credible witness, but now apologists have managed to smear him and 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 you know poison his well. So let, let's yep. get a non-Mormon geneticist That'll be good. to do an episode. Let's remember to talk to Simon about that. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay, so now we got a couple slides here just to show that there's no confusion as to who the Native Americans are from the church's leaders. And so uh, Prophet Gordon B. Hinckley confirmed the identity of the Native people of the Americas as Lamanites in his dedication of um, I, Ciudad, Juarez. Ciudad Juarez Temple. He said, may the sons and daughters of Father Lehi grow in strength and fulfillment of the ancient promises made concerning concerning them. Elder James E. That was Foss, in 1999. Keep Keep going. Yeah, yeah. It says 99. So Elder James E. Faust in 2000 said, we invoke thy blessings upon this nation of Mexico where so many of the sons and daughters of Father Lehi dwell. I was um, in 2000. Uh, President Thomas S. Monson referred to the attendees of the Villa Via Hermosa, Hermo Via Hermosa. Via Hermosa Mexico Temple dedication as children of Lehi. And President Hinckley said the members attending the Ecuador Temple that they have the blood of Lehi in their veins. Um, President Kimball in 1960 uh, spearheaded the Indian placement program with the intention that the Lamanites among us could have their curse removed and once again become white and delightsome. Of this program, he said, the day of the Lamanites is nigh. For years, they have been growing delightsome and now, uh, and they are now becoming white and delightsome. The children in the home placement program in Utah are often lighter than their brothers and sisters in the Hogan's on the reservation. Oh, that's so gross. Yeah. But this, is, this brings the point that like we should be testing all this Mexican people and like, why is the church not going out and testing the Maya, the people in Ciudad yep. Juarez, in Villahermosa? <laughs> like, it yep. should be showing Lehi's DNA. It should be showing Middle Eastern yeah. DNA. Why? Why is the church relying as the strongest evidence for the plausibility of the Book of Mormon being true? Some bones that were found from four thousand years ago, and that doesn't even match the timeline of the Book of Mormon. Yeah, it's and just, just to really and and just to really back up this point, I served a mission in Guatemala. Uh, I spent two years, well, 18 months amongst the, the Guatemalan people. They had no doubt that they were Lamanites. You asked any yeah. Guatemalan, they referred to themselves as Lamanites. They were proud to be Lamanites, and they were told yeah. by missionaries and prophet seers and revelators and mission presidents that came to Guatemala that they were. It wasn't like, hey, a few of you might be Lamanites. We just don't yeah. know which ones. All yep. of them, all of the Guatemalans thought they were Lamanites. Gerardo, what's yep. your what's your witness as as a Mormon raised? Yeah, I tell you, man, if you go to Mexico today, every like all members, I think ninety percent of members will will tell you that they have the blood of Lehi running in their veins. Yeah, and if the church were honest, now that they know the DNA evidence shows that most, if not all, of the Latino Americans and Pacific Islanders aren't descendants of Lehi, they would they would tell them. They would say, hey, state conference, area conference, maybe they would even go to general conference and say, hey, Latin Americans, Pacific Islanders, I know that for two centuries we told you all you were Lamanites, you know, yeah. which, which in and of itself was disgusting and gross and racist and offensive because of the dark skin, yeah. sin, wickedness connotation. Right. Aside from that, we now know through genetics that probably – most, if not all of you, are not Lamanites. And we want to just clear that up. Stop calling yourselves Lamanites. But do they do that? Yep. Gerardo, have they no. done that? No. 
Your parents are no. still in Mexico. Have they have they sent that memo out to your parents? No, my, my dad is a bishop. He would have received it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And yeah, that's a, that's a big deal, right? If yeah. you know, if the church in 2022 knows that half of its membership are referring themselves, referring to themselves with a fictitious or with a non-accurate identity, isn't that incumbent upon the church to let them know they should stop doing that? Yeah. Yeah. I think. I if think they so. were the ones to, who told them that they were Lamanites in the first place, yeah. right? That would be the honest thing to do. Yeah. They would. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, we'll continue on because this is kind of going. So obviously we have this slide and then the next slide, it's just, again, talks about church manuals. They were not confused about DNA until the <laughs> testing came out. Um, <laughs> official church manuals have consistently taught the native, the native peoples of the Americas and the Pacific Islands are Lamanites. Uh, great numbers of Lamanites in North and South America and the South Pacific are now receiving the blessings of the gospel. So this also lumps in the Polynesians um, with the Native Americans into a single lineage that destroys any attempts of this essay to explain why the specific DNA problems concerning Native Americans are okay. You know what I mean? Because now they're putting them together as the same population. Yeah. Um, and, and because um, the Pacific Islanders come from an entirely different part of Asia than the American Indians— um, it makes more problems and uh, the islands that are specifically identified by modern prophets as being um, and, po and apostles as being popular by Haggath and his descendants were actually settled long after the Book of Mormon times. Again, this is where you just complicate yourself with one problem over after another. So if you want to combine the um, South Pacific with the Native Americans, it just makes all of this stuff even worse for them because now you're making truth claim upon truth claim and you, they're incompatible with each other anyways. Yeah. Um, so population bottleneck is the next big uh, area where the, the, the essay focuses. And, and this is from, again, from the church's essay, which is to say population bottleneck is the loss of genetic variation that occurs when a natural disaster, epidemic disease, massive war, or other calamity results in the death of a substantial part of the population. These events may severely reduce or totally eliminate certain genetic profiles. In such cases, a population may regain genetic diversity over time through a mutation, but much of the diversity that previously existed is irretrievably lost, which is to say, if you have four or five different populations, something horrible happens to one or two of them, their color in this particular, if you're watching this, the picture is a bunch of marbles, their colored marbles may fall off because they're dead. So you don't really have that if the other people never intermixed with them. And so what they're trying to say is if the Book of Mormon people lived with another population, were all killed off and then just kind of faded away and were overwhelmed, their markers would disappear. Um, and if you go to the next, we'll just go wait, right wait, to the next slide. Doesn't the oh, Book of Mormon... Uh, when Nephi is getting the revelation from the angel and he's seeing uh, his brothers, Lam Laman and Lamuel's uh, descendants, uh, conquered by uh, what, what, Christopher Columbus. Like, it, isn't that on the Book of Mormon that says that it's Laman and Lamuel's descendants, the ones that are going to be... Um, I have to read that. Yeah, that's a good point. The the, the ones that are going to be conquered by by the Europeans. So th this theory wouldn't work with that revelation received by the angel. Yeah, yeah, because no, because if their genes would have been wiped out, yeah, who are the who are the conquistadors conquering? Right. It's not right. it's not Laman and Lamuel's descendants. Ooh, that's really good. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I mean, yeah, unless I unless they mean that. You know, the one out of a hundred or the one yeah, out yeah. of a thousand, <laughs> right? And that's just it. I mean, and that's just the problem, right? And so we just. But then there's all these yeah. prophecies that they're going to suffer on the hands of the Europeans <laughs> because, you know, because they killed the, the Nephites and. Yep. And yeah. The incredible, yeah, the incredible it. shrinking Lamanite, basically. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> and so. We'll go to the next one. Just some of the problems with, with this idea that the population bottleneck. And so, um, they say, you know, we just kind of said, like, this is an interesting argument to make because the arrival of the first Americans from Asia is a textbook example of genetic bottleneck. It is commonly accepted that a small group of people either passed through a briefly open corridor between ice sheets or followed a coastal route by boat and then spread rapidly throughout the Americas over a period of about 2,000 years where they continued to flourish until the arrival of the European conquerors. Um, if the bottleneck really is such a dire problem for DNA, um, then the people who came 2,000 years ago should be a mystery because of the mutations in the intervening 2,000 years, yet we're still able to easily tra trace their genetic lineage directly back to Siberia into that Malta skeleton from 24,000 years ago, despite the founder effect, despite the bottleneck, and despite a timescale that is so much deeper 
than the Book of mm. Mormon. So basically to say there are areas where you would expect to see bottleneck, but you still see that DNA trickle through because DNA markers are in the billions. And now with the technology, they can pick them out. So even if the the overwhelming number of, of markers might be eventually kind of gone by, you know, evolution and, and, and um, mixing with other populations, you're still going to have them there and we don't find them. Um, and so there's one more slide on population. Isn't, it, isn't it also true that mitochondrial DNA doesn't get bottlenecked? I don't know. It's it's I'm literally sure. passed down. Like I think, it, well, I think that's passed. I think that doesn't. I think mitochondrial DNA doesn't help you as much with population genetics. So I'm guessing that doesn't get bottlenecked because of the fact that it doesn't work in that same way. But I'm I'm not. Well, I'm out, be able my, to answer I'm, that. I'm out of my depth. So yeah, I am way we'll out of my depth on that one. Skip. Um, and so one. But more, what you're saying is that what the church is trying to advocate for here is like something so catastrophic, like yeah, so like to the point where it's almost impossible that could have happened. Yeah, uh, I mean, that could it. have caused a bottleneck where like yeah. we can't find the DNA today. anywhere ever, in any place yeah, ever, exactly. especially yeah. when supposedly Lamanites dotted all the land north, south, central, east, right. west. Yeah. 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 That's just it. I mean, that's really just it. It's, it, it's impossible for this to go. And so um, one more paragraph from the essay on bottlenecks. It says, in addition to the catastrophic war at the end of the Book of Mormon, the European conquest of the Americas in the 15th and 16th centuries touched off just such a cataclysmic chain of events as a result of war and the spread of disease. Many Native American groups experienced devastating population losses. One molecular anthropologist observed that the conquest squeezed the entire Amerindian public Oh, Amerindian population through a genetic bottleneck. He concluded this population reduction has for forever altered the genetics of the surviving groups, thus complicating any attempts at reconstructing the pre-Columbian genetic structure of most New World groups. And, you know, the thing is, this example is telling you that the only people that got squeezed out in DNA testing were the Nephites, Lamanites, Jaredites, and Mulekites, <laughs> while leaving all of the other Native American tribes traceable. So what they're saying is we have DNA of all of these other um, tribes that we can we can still find markers for. Yeah. Yet bo the bottleneck only got the Book of Mormon. So the Book of Mormon people, under this idea, mixed in with this much larger population, and then they mixed in with this much larger population, and then just got perfectly squeezed out just them, and everyone else stayed. I mean, that's the problem. And so, well, and, trying. Sorry, go, oh, ahead. go ahead. No, you can go ahead. Well, when you think about, it's not just the DNA. Well, later, you're probably going to talk about archaeology. Like we can't find any trace that those people existed. Yeah. And it, no, I nothing. mean, the DNA gives you the big picture because like, yep. but, but the fact that we can't find their writings, we can't find their buildings, we can't find the <laughs> their animals, their just, just like the, the, the type of plants they were using, nothing. We can't find anything. It's just. Yeah. If they knew writing, if they knew Hebrew, right, right. and if they knew reformed Egyptian, Egyptian. at least we'd yeah. have that. That's just it. There's, and there's, that, that's the problem. Like, again, we talked about it earlier, like this, the DNA is being confirmed by all these other field, fields of study. And so it's not the DNA on its own that's yeah. contradicting anything else we have. And so with the Book of Mormon, to your point, all the other fields of study are telling us the same thing, that this is not a historical book. <laughs> and the DNA is confirming that. And yeah. so, again, it's, to your point, that's, that's a great way to look at it. It's just we have nothing else to go from. Mm -hmm. And yet we're being told by the church that DNA magically – jumped over these very specific groups of the Book of Mormon while leaving everyone else still there. And, and that's just not, it's not even yeah. remotely plausible. And, and the reason uh, why I was thinking about that is because we can go and look at the pyramids of the Maya build, the pyramids of the Aztecs, the, the Nahua, and then we can confirm that those existed by DNA. We can know the where they came too. from, the right? Egyptians the Egyptians too, right? And, yeah. um, and but But we can't do that with Book of Mormon people. Yeah, why yeah. not? Yeah, that's a problem. Yeah, that's and a so... Point. Yeah, so that leads us to our last big um, kind of idea about the DNA from the assay, which is genetic drift, which is to say that you get a gradual loss of genetic markers in small populations just due to randomness. So, you know, if you took a, a, a jar of like 50 marbles, 25 red, 25 blue, and then you picked out 25, you might not get an equal number of colors. And then over time, one of those colors might go away. And so the church's uh, essay gives you an image where they show, you know, um, 10 red and 10 blue, and then eventually it turns into 20 blue just out of random events. Um, but if you go to the next slide, this is really just throwing everything against the wall and hoping something sticks because <laughs> just like the, the population bottleneck, we are now told that it could be genetic drift instead of the founder effect. So now they're taking like three different ways to say, how could their DNA be wiped from the record? And <laughs> the marble illustration is just terrible because 
you know, there's truth. If you take um, 20, 10, 10 red, 10 blue, and you keep doing a random experiment, eventually you might get rid of one of the colors. But the problem is with, with DNA markers, there are tw- um, 30 billion base pairs of the human genome. So that, the, you know, basically what we wrote in the annotated essay, uh, Kellen wrote, imagine doing this experiment with a jar the size of Texas that contained 30 billion marbles. <laughs> you know, after a few centuries, yeah, you're going to see that you've made a little headway towards removing one of the colors more than the other. <laughs> but at the same time, you're not, you're never going to get rid of all 30 billion. And, and that's what, you know, a lot of the, when you're a podcast with the three geneticists, they were saying like, the idea that you could get um, the 30 billion pairs to just completely erase the record of DNA. I believe the example they used was throwing a pizza against the wall and having it come out the other side untouched because it's impossible. You're talking in just a couple thousand years, the idea you could remove 30 billion um, marbles from a jar. It just, it doesn't happen. And so they're, they're giving you this example without even telling you what would be required for it to work. And they're just hoping you don't think about the difference between 20 marbles and 30 billion uh, base pairs of the human genome. When you talk to Simon, clearly one of his least favorite people on the planet appears to be Hugo (laughs) Borrego. Borrego. And it's not personal. It's not like he thinks he's a bad human, but I, you know, you just get this intense bitterness (laughs) (laughs) that Simon feels towards Hugo. And I think it's because Simon, Simon knows that Hugo should know better. Yeah. That Hugo, Hugo knows that these are, this is an overwhelmingly deceptive argument and yep. and I think just like Egyptologists like Rittner were just so offended at apologists like John Gee yeah. or Kerry yeah. Molstein because they're they're literally disrespecting they're blaspheming it's the science equivalent of oh, yeah, blasphemy I think science yeah. feels like Hugo Perego is just disgustingly distorting genetics to to that's just it I mean yeah, to he, to rescue knows, the Book of Mormon. Yes. And you're using your degree to, 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 um, your reputation. Yeah. Yeah. So you're using your degree to get people to buy into your apologetics. And so you're not doing scholarship. You're doing apologetics using the degree as your appeal to authority. And that is where, you know, I I always get annoyed with into that point. It's like, you know, better. And, and, And when you know better, and then you still push something that, you know, doesn't make sense. That's when I start to say, okay, now you've gone from just being, trying to be faith promoting to being deceptive because you're not giving the full picture to people who don't know better. And, um, I yeah. want to, I so, want to publicly invite Hugo Perego to come on Mormon stories, maybe with Simon and to just yeah. respond to this episode. Well, yeah, I mean, I would love, uh, cause like I said, I, I don't know. Um, I think, I think his name's Hugo Perego, but, um, either what way, did I say? Uh, Hugo, but I think it's, oh, it's without the H, I think oh, okay. it's you, but either way, I mean, you know, it's just, it, like I said, we, I don't apologists typically don't want to come on because it's really hard when you're presenting something and then you get pushback because when you're mixing it with the theology of the book of Mormon, that's when you get into trouble. I know you go Prego from what I've heard. I think Simon even said it like the dude's a brilliant guy. He could talk about this stuff all day, but then when you have to mix it with theology, that's when you get into trouble. And I don't think he'll ever put himself out there, but we'll see. I mean, maybe someday uh, yeah. we'll, we'll get there, but anyways, let's, well, we're almost we're almost uh, around here for for those of you um, who are sticking in, and so this is one last. Um, no, we're doing good. We're under two hours. This is great. Right. Yeah, I think, we'll, I think we'll be okay. So, um, this is from the church's essay, and they say a study in Iceland combining both genetic and genealogical data demonstrates that the majority of people living in that country today inherited mitochondrial D- mitochondrial DNA from just a small percentage of the people who lived there only 300 years ago. The mitochondrial DNA of the majority of Icelanders living at that time simply did not survive the random effects of drift. It is conceivable that much of the DNA of Book of Mormon peoples did not survive for the same reason. And again, even in this scenario, genetic drift has still not been significant enough that there is the least bit of contention where they came from or when they arrived. And so they're making this thing to say genetic drift is happening, but we still know where they came from. We still know where, who they are. And so again, it's not making the case they're saying it is there. And I, and um, I know on, on the episode you guys did way back when, you know, eight years ago, whenever it was, they, they mentioned that Iceland has a very uh, unique um, situation as far as genetics go, because it's so isolated. So it's, it, it's cherry picking a study that isn't, isn't comparable to the Americas anyways, but even still, we know who they are. We still know when they came from. So to make that claim that this gives the book of Mormon plausibility, it just doesn't work because 
they're literally giving us an example that still shows us who they are. And in the Book of Mormon, we still can't find their DNA anywhere. Well, but I think their point here is like, well, that's 300 years ago, but if you yeah, multiply 300 by, you know, right. 2000. Then that's true. And that's fair. But like, but again, know, think, there's too many G, too many base pairs and too few years. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah, there's just not enough time for it to happen, and that's the whole thing. Well, and, so, and when you have the Jaredites coming, you have the the Lehites coming, Mulekites, like you have so many Hebrews coming and populating America all the way to like two thousand two million soldiers fighting in the wars, filling the land north, south, yeah. east, and west with millions of soldiers. Right, right. Yeah. No, that's the problem. It just gets it's just too much. But 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 we start with where we started in this episode. The Book of Mormon says God's going to protect the land and not let anyone else come here. Yeah. Period. Yeah. I mean that that makes all the rest of this conversation irrelevant. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yep. All right. Yeah, and that's just it. And so. Um, this is again, a quote from Jamie Hannes Handy from the episode. Cause she was just so good at it. And, um, she just talks about this essay and she says, I feel like it's just intellectually dishonest. It says genetic profiles may be entirely lost and combinations that once existed may become so diluted that they're difficult to detect. And I just, again, want to emphasize that with computers that can handle 3 billion nucleotide pairs, difficult to detect is not true anymore. Our ability to detect even the smallest the very smallest data is growing with every day that these computers are running data analysis. And so she's just saying, like, you can't say that these things are disappearing because they can find too much. It's the, the technology is getting better. And it's just dishonest to say that they might be lost when we know that that's just not what actually happens in, in reality. So you could say, well, in theory, they could be lost. But in reality, they're just they're, they're, it's not happening. And so to make that claim as if that's the, the likely or even possible solution, I, I think is just bad. And um to continue with 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 uh, Jamie, because she, like I said, I just loved the way she presented this this episode with you guys. Um, from the essay, the essay says, much as critics and defenders of the Book of Mormon would like to use DNA studies to support their views, the evidence is simply inconclusive. So they're saying both, hey, if you're a defender of the Book of Mormon, you can't use it either, which is really convenient because DNA does not <laughs> bolster their view regardless. Um, but she says, yeah. it's not that as our ability to test DNA data for ancestry markers increases that we're getting any kind of new picture. We're just honing in. It's almost like initially we started with a three megapixel camera. There were certainly maybe some darker areas and some lighter areas. And the more we get it, we're getting a much more higher resolution photo with passing time. There hasn't been anything that is drastically altering the photo and the narrative and the story of the origins of ind indigenous populations. And instead, it is honing in and redefining and making more clear the picture that we had already understood. And so she's just making the point we're making, which is to say we're getting more and more data every day. And every day the picture is telling us over and over again that the Book of Mormon's story and narrative is not historical. Yeah. And nothing has changed that. Nothing has come out since DNA studies took over to change that. And so to kind of say that we just don't know. Well, it's making it, this this essay more and more irrelevant because the yeah. more we find, the more markers we're able to test the yep. every day, the more impl impossible these theories um, yeah. become. That's just it. I mean, and you're right. And that's and you, that's the perfect way to say it. It's just the essay becomes more and more nonsensical with, with time. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and at some point, they're either going to have to change the essay or remove it or do something because it just it gets embarrassing at some point to continue to hold on to something that is just overwhelmingly. And again, it's not just DNA. DNA is, again, confirming other things. And so wouldn't it, be, point, wouldn't it be I just have to say, wouldn't it be amazing if in one instance the Book of Mormon or the Doctrine and Covenants or the Book of Abraham or <laughs> Prophets, Seers, and Revelators. Kinder Hoplates. Kinder Hoplates revealed one piece of information, just yep. one, just one, that the entire you know body of science went, whoa, now there's <laughs> something true. that changes everything. But it's not true. one instance has that ever happened. Nahum. Nope. Ever. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I think that convinced the dudes at the Maxwell Institute, but like, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, I don't yeah, think it would convince just, anyone sad. else outside of the Maxwell Institute. Yeah. I just one time. So I'm just, come on, <laughs> Maxwell Institute, Fair Mormon, one time. Can you find me one instance where history, revelations, Mormon scripture taught science a thing or two in, in something meaningful? Yeah. Anyway, sorry. No, just, that's true. No, you're good. So, <laughs> all right. So this one, it's just a conclusion from their essay, which is to say, Nothing is known about the DNA of Book of Mormon peoples. Even if such information were known, processes such as population bottleneck, genetic drift, and post-Columbian immigration from West Eurasia make it unlikely that their DNA could be detected today. As Elder Dallin H. Oaks of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles 
uh, speaking as a lawyer, uh, observed, <laughs> it is our position that secular evidence can neither prove nor disprove the authenticity of the Book of Mormon. And again, it's just like I, I mentioned this earlier. It's kind of like what they're doing with Heavenly Mother now, which is to say, we, we, we don't want to speculate on it because what we do know doesn't help our cause. So just don't worry about it. And it's just, it's, again, the Book of Mormon was supposed to be this record that will be proven with time. And because it's being proved, disproven with time, <laughs> then they say, basically, guys, we, we can't know either way, so just stop looking. And it's just, it's such an intellectually dishonest approach to the members that you require so much of. Yeah. To me, that quote basically says, these are not the droids you're looking for. That, yeah, that's, that's it's, exactly it's, what that it's, quote is, is like, yep. you should, well, who would ever expect science to validate the Book of Mormon? Of yep, course, science can't validate it, except for the fact that the Mormon church paid archaeologists and anthropologists and geneticists tons of money for decades yep. to try and prove the Book of Mormon was true. But then once all that money that got wasted, which yep. was tithing, by the way, failed to prove the Book of Mormon true to the point of Thomas Ferguson losing his faith over going on those archaeological and anthropological digs. Well, then all of a sudden, of course, science, of course, now general authority is saying, of course, science could never prove or just prove the Book of Mormon. Yeah, that's just it. Yeah, yeah it is. And um, yeah. and like, so um, we have one last slide and it's got a small video and it's a video um, uh, from a, a church produced video called People of Destiny. And it's where they rewrite the history of the Native Americans and the Polynesians and basically interject the Book of Mormon history into their history. And I just want to watch this. It's like a 55 second clip of this, this woman and her kids because it just shows how heartbreaking it is when you take someone's identity with the history that is simply not true. And so if we could just watch that really quick. We sit around the kitchen table every morning and read from its pages as a family. We have learned about a man named Lehi, about his son, Nephi and Jacob. We have grown to love these men very much and learn from the Book of Mormon that we are their descendants, that we come from them. And because we love them so much, we have named our sons after them. This is Lehi. He is a very special young man. And this is Nephi. We are grateful for these men because we have given their names to our sons so that our sons can remember them. And I just, I just have to ask Gerardo, you, you know, how does that feel for you as someone who, who is a native, you know, who, who is a Latino, yeah. who has ancestors from, from, you know, Native American ancestors. How does that make you feel? Well, it feels invasive. Um, and in Mexico, people do that a lot. They name their kids after Book of Mormon characters, Nephi, uh, Lehi, because they really believe that they are descendants from these people. And it's sad that they, uh, that the church has hijacked their real history. Yeah. Well, well, Mike, you you got to run. Yeah, so, do run you want to give quick. us any final any final thoughts? No, just again, like I think as we go through these overviews, it's really important to take them in totality and to look at how the apologetics function within the problems. And if they don't make sense, then you have to ask yourself, what does that mean? And once you get to that point, if you're open to it, I hope you'll read more, check out our future episodes, and just you know, even if you want to remain a believer, I think it's just important you understand that these problems are real. They don't go away, and a lot of the church's apologetics just simply don't fit the evidence, even though they'll try to frame them in a way that they do. And so I hope that at least you're getting um, learning some new stuff out of these episodes. So I hope that's the case, and, and I appreciate anyone who's listening and giving us feedback and all of that. Well, Mike, you, you've been great. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you guys uh, so much. Thank you so much for your willingness yep. to come on. Yeah, we'll see you and guys all soon. We'll see you. We'll see you on another episode really quick. Yeah, definitely. Take care, guys. All Bye. right. And I think I, what I want to do is go ahead and read um, the final slide that Mike wasn't able to read because the final slide does a really good summary. And so what he says is, you know, the conclusions on DNA, the Book of Mormon, number one, until DNA studies arrived, the Book of Mormon was clear that the Americans were populated from Jerusalem um, along with Joseph Smith and God via claimed revelations, I would add all prophets, seers, and revelators from Joseph Smith through Spencer W. Kimball, even as Jeff Benson, even Gordon B. Hinckley, there was no confusion about who the, the Lamanites were. It was Native Americans. So it wasn't until DNA studies arrived that that was a problem. Second, once DNA showed that Native Americans have nothing to do with the Book of Mormon times, the church changed their introduction to the Book of Mormon 
to acknowledge that they got it wrong. Isn't that why we have prophets, seers, and revelators? To see things in advance, not to respond to science once science has disproved the predominant narrative, which Richard Bushman himself has agreed uh, yeah. is not true. The third bullet, teaching Native Americans and Polynesians that the Book of Mormon is history is stealing their true identities and rewriting the history of their ancestors. That's a big problem that Gerardo just spoke to. And then finally, <clears throat> point four, summary point four, if the Book of Mormon got it wrong, Joseph Smith got it wrong, and even God got it wrong via Revelation, and I would even add, then the Scriptures get it wrong, the Book of Mormon got it wrong, the Doctrine and Covenants got it wrong, and then, of course, you know, what does that tell us? And I'll just add, even if you were to just take the DNA issue in isolation, you know, I guess in theory, I, th I think it, it's, it's pretty fatal to the Book of Mormon, but it's not just DNA. Yeah. It's the Book of Abraham. It's the Kinderhook plates. It's polyandry and polygamy. It's the golden plates problem. It's the translation. It's the archaeology, the linguistics. It's the, the, the folk magic and the treasure digging. It's the racism. How about the racism in the Book of Mormon? Like, you just add all of these things up, and it, it seems to be overwhelming. Her Gerardo, do you want to give a, a final thought? Yeah, I agree. And I was just thinking, um, to me, how it's not different than, you know, when colonizers came to Mexico and trying to impose the Catholic Church, uh, try to wipe their um, native's history and try to impose, you know, a new religion. That's kind of what the, what the church is doing, um, imposing this new religion and telling the Native Americans and people in Mexico and Latin America that their history is not valid and that this this is the one that they should be trusting and believing in. It's kind of sad. Yeah. All right, and we're only uh, we're only like five episodes in <laughs> to what's going to be like a fifty or sixty <laughs> yeah. uh, episode series. Hopefully, I mean maybe that's too ambitious. Maybe Mike's going to lose steam. But even if we just have these five, for me these five are just profoundly. And this is all sorts of stuff I have not thought through clearly that I did don't don't didn't and still don't have a strong command of. Like, um, this is really fascinating stuff. Aren't, yeah. aren't you loving this? Yeah, it's great. And seeing all the issues, like, consecutively and, like, you know, one after the other. And and then it's like Jeremy Runnels always says, you have to look at the problems. Like, you have to look at the forest, not at just one tree. Yeah. Because we, when you look at, like you said, the DNA in aggregate with all the other issues, it just really, really, it's fatal. Yeah. All right. Well, and and you know what? If you disagree, if you understand genetics, and and you want to come on with me and Gerardo or Mike or Simon Southerton, and respond to this video, uh, we would love to see it. If you want to respond to the Golden Plates episode, if you want to respond to um, the uh, the Book of Mormon translation episode or the Folk Magic episode, and, and you're a historian or a scientist, or just a really smart, thoughtful human, we don't want to make it sound like, you know, this is this is just open and shut, uh, closed case. But we would want to hear from you, someone with credibility, someone who's willing to really consider the evidence and give a plausible explanation for why we're seeing it wrong. Because if we're seeing it wrong, wouldn't, wouldn't you want to know, Gerardo? Yeah. Yeah, if, if the Book of Mormon really is your history, the history of your ancestors, wouldn't you want to know? Yeah. I I see it really hard when Terrell Givens is telling us that there's so much of Joseph Smith in it that, you know, like in the Book of Mormon, like apologists today are admitting that yeah. there's so much of 19th century stuff in it that gives little room for it to actually be an actual factual history of, yeah. of Native Americans. Yeah. But, I mean, but we're open in theory. <laughs> I mean, really, if you've got something really good, please let us know. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, Gerardo, I'm really grateful you could join us. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's great to have you. And all our viewers and listeners, please check out LDSdiscussions.com for the 60 plus essays that Mike has done. Plus, he does an entire review of the book Saints and talks about and the gospel topics essays. It's such an amazing website. 
Check out ODSdiscussions.com. Check out our past episodes. Know that we're going to be doing many, many more of these episodes. Look for about one a week. Uh, we may have a bit of a pause over the summer. We'll see. But um, if, if you value this content, if you want to see it continue, then we really hope you will donate uh, to pay for Gerardo's time, to pay for Jen's time, Jennifer's time, Brooklyn's time, my time, uh, these resources. We really need your support. So become a monthly donor if you support these series. Uh, click on mormonstories.org. Click on the donate button. 10 bucks a month, 20 bucks a month, 50 bucks a month, 100 bucks a month, whatever you can afford. We're transparent in our finances. Um, it's tax deductible in the United States. And all of the money goes towards the mission of the Open Stories Foundation, which is to provide informed consent to Mormons and more investigators and non-Mormons, and then is to provide support for people in faith transition, um, people who are in faith crisis, and to support people who have to leave Mormonism or Mormon orthodoxy. We want to provide support to make it, uh, to have as many families the least amount of families destroyed, the least amount of marriages destroyed, the most amount of, of health and well-being, the least amount of anxiety and depression, uh, the, the most amount of community for people who lose their community once they start to doubt or question their church or lose their family or lose their friends. That's what we're all about. We're not about destroying Mormonism. We're not about destroying the Mormon church. We're not even about taking people's faith away or convincing them to leave the church. If, if you... Um, no other stuff, and you still remain in the church, double thumbs up, more power to you. We support people remaining Mormon. Um, we just want everyone to know the truth and then to make their decisions from there. So thanks very much for joining us today on Mormon Stories. Please email us with feedback at mormonstories at gmail.com. Please follow us on all the social medias, and we'll see you all again very soon on another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. Thanks, everybody. Take care.